prevent winds, heat winds, and just about any other stat you could count. Kelly defies logic, age, and entropy. But Slater's greatest gift isn't just his sheer dominance. He's still in there. Oh, oh, yes! oh my God. As the sport's first true crossover star, he made his name synonymous with surfing writ large, inspiring waves of new challengers and unlocking a new stratosphere of success for every kid with a surfboard and a dream. The new crop of surfing's brightest stars will face off at the 2022 Rip Curl WSL Finals. I'm Eric Abel. I'm the artist for this year's Rip Curl WSL Finals in Trestles. Being a surf artist and, and getting to do the artwork for the Rip Curl WSL Finals at Trestles, the biggest day in surfing of the year, I mean, what more could you ask for? So it was pretty cool designing the jerseys for this event. Each jersey represents kind of a different aspect of Trestles. We got the blue one, it's got perfect wave on it. You got the green one, you got the flora coming down, walking down trestles, the iconic trestles cobblestones for orange. And the pink one, you got the pelican. And the number one jersey, got the nice yellow sunshine going. So it's just a really cool element in this project to design the jerseys for the top five. I'm gonna be doing some sort of artwork down there. It's gonna be epic, the surf, I'm sure it's gonna be pumping. Everybody's gonna be going off. The Rip Curl WSL Finals is brought to you by Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company. By Shiseido, official sunscreen of the World Surf League. By Sambazon, bringing you the delicious powers of acai every day. Official acai of the Rip Curl WSL Finals. By Flying Embers, Official hard kombucha of the World Surf League. And by Turtle Bay, official resort of the World Surf League. The stage is set for the Rip Curl WSL Finals for the title match. Carissa Moore meets longtime rival Stephanie Gilmore. Felipe Toledo will meet Italo Ferreira. Interesting situation with a lot of big names that have been there for so many years. And it could be their career defining day. This afternoon, we're on a brief hold, just anticipating fireworks before we get Riss and Steph in the lineup as well. Joe Trapel with two surfers that have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to beat two of the best ever, Rosie and Laura Enever. Starting with you, Rosie, thinking the longevity with Steph Gilmore, what she's accomplished just to get to the the title match with her longtime rival. That's a huge statement today. It's huge. I mean, thinking about the way that Steph's been able to pick off her competitors one by one this morning, we've definitely see, seen her start to like take it up a notch in every match that she's had. This morning, shaky start with Brisa, so she's definitely had this evolution. She's looking confident and really starting to open up. Also looking at Carissa Moore, you know, not surfing yet today. Are you going to see that as an advantage? Uh, does Gilmore have enough left, or will she still stay on fire knowing that she's accomplished a lot. Well, we'll have to see, but uh, I did see Steph drinking some fancy drinks in there and, you know, <laughs> hydrating and meditating and doing all the things to try and conserve all that energy. But, uh, you know, this is the format. They've had, you know, a couple of weeks since Tahiti to prepare for this and, and know that, you know, Stephanie in that first, first heat, if she wanted to surf to a world title, She's surfing four, five, potentially six heats today. And, and a beautiful wave like lower is just to host that beautiful frontside wrap finesse, but also pushing it with a solid powerhouse reverse. On the men's bracket, we saw Italo go a long way this morning, all the way from match number one. 2019 world champ will face off in an all-Brazilian title match against Felipe Toledo. They've got a lot of history. It's been fun to see them find rhythm at different parts of this season, obviously favoring the man in the Hydro Flask leader of Jersey, Felipe Toledo, very close to his first world title. Yeah, very close, but you would think that the most dangerous person in the mix for Felipe is someone like Italo because he has that world title. He knows how to handle that pressure. So this is a huge matchup. Let's see how Felipe can handle the moment. Looking at the women's bracket, it's going to be a classic. The world champions to decide it all. And what's really cool about this, Laura, is I asked Carissa a couple years ago when this format was just being introduced, who would you want sitting next to you to go for a world title? Oftentimes, Riss kind of brushed
rushes that question and says it doesn't matter. She went straight to Steph Gilmore. She's been wanting this to unfold for a few years. It's going to happen today. Well, there's nothing more sweet than beating the best to win that world title. And, uh, you know, Steph's been quite an underdog all year. You know, she's just, you know, she was fighting to make the cut, fighting to make the top five. You know, Chris has been up the top in, in the yellow sparkles most of the year. So, you know, for Steph, she's, she's you know, the underdog. And just like Italo was saying, not the favorite to come into today, but, you know, just being down down the bottom but you know Steph is feeling re very very confident it's interesting when you run into Stephanie Gilmore Chris Moore on land you're going okay nicest human beings you'll ever meet but when they're in the same room they almost have to give each other some space because they are there to accomplish that one goal to win let's now send it to the beach with Chris Cote and now the moment you've all been waiting for the title match it determine who will be your 2022 world champion Surfing out of Kingscliff, Australia, in the orange jersey, give it up for seven-time world champion, Stephanie Gilmore! And your number one seed, reigning back-to-back -back champion, six-time world champion, in the Hydro Flask leader jersey, Carissa Moore! Your title matches are Carissa Moore preparing for Stephanie Gilmore here at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. For the first four decades of the World Tour, Brazil was on the rise, but had yet to produce a world champion. That all changed in 2014 when Gabriel Medina staked his claim and planted the Brazilian flag at the peak of pro surfing. He won Brazil's first world title and broke open the gates, ushering in the current era of pure progression. Not only did his coronation create a new world order, it declared his and Brazil's brand of high octane surfing as the new standard. The message was clear, push the limits, or get left behind. Here he goes, Medina's first wave of the final, super deep in pipe, and comes out. His influence will be seen all across the 2022 Rip Curl WSL Finals. People falling from the sky. At least no one got hurt, that was good. I'm really happy no one got hurt. My Aussie accent is making it really hard for me to say Te Hupo. Kelly Slater is one of the best at Te Hupo. I just can't say it. The correct way to say chops is Te Ahupo. Te Ahupo. Te Ahupo. Oh, do you big man ass? Here comes Molly Pickle. Big swing. Front side hook. Moore at back door, threading the needle, and she comes out. Big opening snap, and another. Well, a buzzer beater to get the victory. Steph Gilmore, she's gone through match one, match two, and match three, and has built momentum. If Carissa is paying attention to this, it would probably psychologically play a little bit on your head. Each heat's getting better and better, and I'm so pumped. Let's do this. Time for the title match. Two of the best ever to ride a surfboard and compete for world titles. Carissa Moore and Stephanie Gilmore. Gilmore qualified back in 2007 and still is the only rookie to qualify and win a world title in that rookie season. She went on to four straights 
And there was one surfer from Honolulu, Hawaii that came in and started disrupting Steph's reign, and that was Carissa Moore. They started trading world titles, and then Tyler Wright got in the mix for a couple of there. But this has been the dynasty that we've been enjoying for a very long time, Rosie. I love it. I mean, uh, Laura and I were just catching up off screen, and we were just saying, this is the fairy tale. Just the fact that as surf fans, we get to watch two of the greatest go head to head in this, you know, three matchup, best of three or like best of two. It's just like, it's what we want to see at the end of the day. And we were just saying, you know, Carissa with five world titles, Steph with seven. If Steph is going to lose this to Carissa right now, Chris is edging closer, and that's going to be something that, you know, Steph has allowed right here today. But, you know, Steph, she's got her whole fans down there, and they, they're all holding eights up, and so she wants that eight. Title match number one just getting started. 35-minute heats. Carissa versus Steph Gilmore. Both have won out here at the championship tour level. Gilmore in 2014, Carissa won this in 2015, along with all the amateur accolades that she had before she was 12 years of age. She kind of graduated early and started traveling the world. Carissa Moore featuring here at the Rip Curl WSL Finals in the Hydro Flask Leaders jersey. But it didn't always look easy as we reflect back on the season. Uh, she's making finals, consistent reigning on top of the world, but it felt like she had more challenges than we knew about this year. And I think the emotion when she won in Brazil really came clear that she was digging deep this year to really find her motivation to hunt down a six world title. Yeah, you know, we can often tell in, in Carissa's, you know, body language, in her expressions, just what she's feeling. And obviously we've been following her so closely this season as with every season. And you could tell how much that win in Brazil was such a clutch performance from her. But that was that breakthrough win that she'd been searching for all season. And sort of starting with maybe one of her toughest results in an opening round ever, where she basically didn't get scores. And that's when she said she felt so proud of herself. She had the worst feeling in, competi in her competitive career and to the best when she turned it around into a positive which imme immediately makes me think of Steph's tough start to the year, missing out on Pipeline, and all of a sudden we had Steph Gilmore's name, one of the biggest names in surfing, and it was almost scary to say this at the first stops of the season. We were going, wait, will she make this mid-season cut? And look, look what she's doing now here in September. Yeah, absolutely wild. I think Steph and Carissa have so much to look back on on their years. And, and you know, just, you know, as surfers, we all say we're always growing. We're always learning, evolving. And, you know, they both have overcome a lot of hurdles in their competitive, you know, careers this, this year. And, uh, you know, Steph got that, uh, she, she uh, missed out on pipe and then she lost out really early at sunset and she had to fight her way back to make the cut and then had to fight to the, to the end to make it into this top five. So... To see this matchup is unbelievable. And I think it's kind of what motivates her the most, to go for number eight, uh, along with having that record to yourself. I mean, that's just adding to your legacy. But almost like she felt like, I think, where it looked like she could just rely on her talent alone to win those early world titles. She was setting the benchmark for something new, kind of like a Kelly Slater 90s story. And then when it became harder, she started rededicating herself to the craft. Well, she, we heard from her earlier today, and she was just talking about her progression and, and all of those factors. And she seems to be given honest assessment of herself, but she also seems to be really hard on herself and her yeah. performances. So she really gets down to the nitty gritty, and she's not afraid to say, I need to work on my progression. The other girls are stronger than me. I need to train more. So yeah, it's, a, it's an honest expression. And the fact that she still has that motivation <laughs> at this point in her career, you know, she's the oldest on tour, and she's, you know, she's so accomplished, but she still is willing to learn. And we even saw that in Tahiti this year she wasn't she was hard on her performance there and she said you know I'm going to come back and I want to keep learning and, and getting better what an exciting matchup a treat for all surf fans getting to witness the two of the best world champs going head to head in the title match Strider how does it feel in the water well you know what I, I just can't wait to see what Carissa brings to the to the performance level I feel like you know she's obviously the number one surfer in the world right now you know she's got that hydro flash number one jersey on and i feel like she's got everything it takes to win this whole thing but will she have the mental capacity to do it you know we at this level they have the talent and and i know stephanie has built momentum and has the mental uh fortitude at the moment to push harder and harder and harder until the final horn blows we're going to see what carissa has we're going to see what her mental coach because she has a mental coach has done with her and see if they've got her to a place to succeed today. Love it, Strider. What a, what a stage that we have in front of us. Lower trestles, two that have accomplished a lot on this venue. 
and Carissa looking for a sixth title. Steph looking for a record-breaking eighth world title, which could happen this afternoon. For one thing Rissa has going for her as well is consistency. Uh, oftentimes it was tough to go kind of back to back with her reign because of Steph, because of Tyler. But now she's been on this hot streak, potentially three in a row if she gets it done today. Yeah, it's such an impressive thought. And also talk, talking about, you know, overcoming challenges this season, the grit that Carissa has shown. I mean, Jeffrey's Bay, I'm thinking about that quarterfinal where she had a lot to overcome with the snap leash and the runarounds and all of that. So, you know, both of these women, they've been, you know, gone through the fire this year and they've come out stronger. And here they are standing at the top in these final matchup. Looking forward to the title match for the men as well. Italo will be gunning for a second world title. Ferreira is with Luisa. Italo, you're on fire. Can tell. Uh, yeah, I'm so stoked, you know, and um, there's a lot of waves out there and I've drawn strikes to surf and having fun and um, there's two more in a row and um, that's what I said before. Um, I'm not the favorite here, but I am have a lot of faith, so I'm ready for that. Quer mandar um beijo pra dona Catiana, seu Luiz, falar que você fez bonito aqui. É, meu pai, minha mãe, é, obrigado pela energia, minha família, lá, meus amigos estão em casa. É, manda boas energias aí, ora bastante, pede a Deus que vai estar tudo certo. Só falta mais duas, vamos nessa. Yeah, he just said, like, my family, please pray for me, send all the energy. Again, he said that he's not the favorite, but he feels in his gut that he can make it. So you can feel in his voice how, how emotional he is. So he just has to go and get ready because this is going to be a battle of the gods. We're right there with you, Luisa. Yeah, what a clash. All Brazilian title match will begin right after this. Italo Ferreira trying to do the impossible coming from title match number one. And then the total contrast where Felipe Toledo hasn't served yet since he's wearing the Hydro Flask leader's jersey. Finally getting a start here. The Australian Steph Gilmore, big forehand hook. Drills it again, perfect. Carving work for Steph Gilmore. Jams it off the lip. Will she finish? She'll get knocked out on the final turn. But boy, those first two cars wow. were so sweet to watch. What about the hustle for that wave too? Both those women wanted that one. Steph obviously on that inside position a little further out. She had to dig hard to get on that wave. And that's the aggression from Steph we're seeing. You know, she she took that inside. She had the authority. She wanted that wave. And you know, it almost even looked like there was a bit of a, a push down from Carissa here. Hopefully not a uh, interference there, but it actually worked out for Steph in her favor because she came around perfectly for that beautiful section there. Absolutely unbelievable surfing, just so strong. She's just looking so much stronger throughout the day and uh, unfortunately going down, that would have been a really excellent score to start the heat. We've seen a lot of iterations of this carve throughout the day. I feel like Steph's just gone to that next level on that maneuver right now. She's really reserved something in the tank for these final matchups. So you just watch this woman and she's just pushing harder and harder as she's going through the motions. It just feels like her, her feet are just in the wax and they're in the perfect position. You know, she was stumbling around this morning and it just seems like everything is totally connected now. Uh, you know, she's just thinking like this is like the longest uh, Grom surf, day, surf session <laughs> ever. <laughs> but you know, she she loves surfing all day. She's actually a Grom. Such a Grom at heart. Looking for a record-breaking eighth world title today as we stand by for scores. Let's dive more into the rivalry with these two legends. Looking at the deep stats, powered by Hydro Flask, Carissa Moore leads this rivalry with 15 wins, but Gilmore with 12. Basically, it depends on the day, what venue you're at, where they're at in their careers. Earlier this season, feels like a long time ago, back at Bells, they had the quarterfinal with all the cut talk on the line and the intensity of arriving in Australia earlier this year. That's when I saw Gilmore kind of feeling the wobbly legs, like yeah. the moment kind of overtook her on that day on the Bells Bowl. Yeah, and I was just saying uh, to, to Rosie earlier that, you know, Steph this year, I feel like she's in the position, uh, you know, coming into this event because of her, you know, inconsistency, in, inconsistency and incompletion. Whereas Carissa's on the other end, she's got the completion, she's got that consistency. So to see Steph right now open up with an 8-5 and she's found that completion, well, not there, that would have gone very high if she completed that, but, you Steph know. Gilmore, 8.33, what a way to kick off this heat. We think about how slow her morning started against Brisa Hennessy, comboed at the halfway mark, and she served her way into gear, into form. All year we've been going, what, what's the favorite position? We were trying to analyze it last year, and even when we were sitting with uh, Kelly recently at the previous event, 
he was kind of saying, why wouldn't you want to be number one? That's obvious. However, the argument would be, <laughs> I think Gilmore needed to have this start this morning. But it's all your perspective, right? I think it doesn't matter because once you come into the final five, where you're at is where you're at. The music stopped you in your chair and that's your starting position. So I think taking that positive spin, I mean, Obviously, you would think about having that advantage as the number one seat, but the position that you're in as the athlete, you've got to take that and run. We just heard from Italo because he's been a very busy man today on the polar opposite side waiting for his first surf is Felipe Toledo. Kaipo, have you found him yet? Yeah, I got Felipe. He's downstairs warming up, getting into the mind space that he needs to be for that title match. Uh, it's all coming down to this moment right now for Felipe Toledo. This is his whole year and the possibility of a world title. He's staying loose. He's staying limber. He's staying in the zone. There's a lot on the line and the pressure's building. Nice space there in the Red Bull Athlete Zone for Felipe Toledo as we saw him get the Oakley athlete shuttle down here just moments ago. So he definitely was staying clear of the early morning hype and energy, staying with his family. He's trying to pretend it's a normal day. You can only pretend for so long because it's right in front of his face with a world title on the line. Chris Moore lining up her first turn against Gilmore. It's a quick top turn wrap. Throws it vertically, fins out the back. Quick decision to knife it again. The Hawaiian's on the board. Nice completion there from Carissa and uh, you know not sh not not showing those shaky legs at all so you know she's she's done some great warm up this morning her team they've gotten her ready you know just like we were, you were saying before Joe uh, you know having to sit and watch your opponent all day just go from strength to strength and not let that get to your head you know watching Steph just build and build and then you know she comboed Joanne DeFay in the last heat and you know she's just probably thinking well I really need to be on. What'd you see here, Rosie? Well, what I'm seeing, Joe, you know, this seems like this had a bit of a uh, texture to it from that northerly wind that we've seen uh, kick up. But one thing I note about Carissa always is the way that she's able to cut through those lumps and bumps. She's that woman that's able to hold that rail. She has the strength in the legs to kind of smooth out those turns and overcome the ridges on the wave. Yeah. Carissa, you know, she just has that power and the, you know, the style and the flow and, and the technique. It's all wrapped into just this beautiful little bubble. And, uh, you know, she's just so solid on her feet. It's such a great comparison when you have two of the all-time greats. How fun is it that you yeah. get to compare <laughs> Steph versus Carissa, where Steph often wins the best style conversation, male or female, for her grace and her flow, connection of turns, longevity through her rail line. And then you know what Carissa's done above the lip with high performance and especially with a lot of power that she brings to this way. She does bring a lot of power. I also love, you know, her strength. Her strength is um, so appealing to me in her surfing and also her waves of consequence this year that she's done so well at. I mean, Papline making the final, her showing in um, Tahiti was Im is so impressive. So, you know, she's such a well-rounded surfer when we think about her strengths. There is interesting moments at the start of the season in the past when there'd be the WSL awards where the previous champion would actually have to hand off the trophy to the current champion. When it was Steph and Chris and those rivalries, I remember just eavesdropping on conversation with high officials. I wasn't allowed to be in those rooms. <laughs> just saying like, do I have to? Do I have to do that? And because that's how they're starting their year. They're not, they don't want to give anything up. For them, they're doing all the mental prep to say that they are still the best in the world. So even just that physical motion of letting go of a trophy, they did everything they could to get out of it at the time. All goes into a title campaign for Gilmore often compared to that natural kind of free surfer, almost like a, uh, a female version of a Dane, where you're almost like, oh, are you trying? Because it just comes so easily to you. And she'll acknowledge how much work she actually has put in, especially knowing that she'd have to surf through a lot of heats today. One thing that I've loved this season, Laura, is just your insights on Steph, because you've noted to us, how competitive she is, no matter what it is. But then also there's little superstitions. Like I think in El Salvador, she wore the same shorts. You were saying she ate the same meal every night, sat at the same table. So, you know, there's this little bit of quirkiness that comes with these champions and what they like to do before heats and their routines and everything. So, yeah. so cool when we have moments like this with so many titles in the water. Let's just keep up stacking more world titles. There's four with Lisa Anderson sitting right next to Ronnie Blakey. Thank you, Joe. Lisa, an absolute pleasure. We have to get you down there, down here for the, the big moments. And obviously today is the biggest day of the year in professional surfing. Uh, how's your anxiety levels at the moment? <laughs> I mean, uh, since the first heat of the morning, I've been on edge. And um, yeah, I mean, this is just 
this is what you really want to see this this type of final right now and then it's been a long morning like just you know hoping that, that we would get to see this kind of action I'm, I'm so excited when we were talking about the history between these two and the fact that they've actually never really had a, a kind of a, a tough head-to-head -head battle for a world title together you had a bit of an aha uh -huh moment like you were like wow that's <laughs> that's true hasn't happened this is awesome yeah no it hasn't happened there's been so many uh, uh, different exchanges through the past few years and um you know you pointed that out and i was like oh really i didn't even realize that but this is really awesome i think that um they've probably been waiting for this moment for a very long time and i'm sure that in their minds and in their preparation they were ready for this there's the multiple world champions uh yourself lane beachley obviously these two surfers already in that conversation it's just so fun being able to watch these two battle it out for a, a world title here. Steph after an eighth, looking to break that deadlock with Lane, and Carissa obviously chasing a six. It's it's interesting because it, it feels like Carissa's maybe got a little bit more gas in the tank to go chasing more titles and event wins over the years. Yeah, I honestly believe that. I, I was thinking if if Steph, you know, God forbid, didn't like win an eighth world title, I knew Carissa was looking for that eight world titles. You know what I mean? I I believe she has it in her for sure. Um, I don't see any of these guys stepping down anytime soon there's just their surfing is just getting better and better every event yeah we're seeing carissa up at the moment too why don't you take us through a, a bit of the power on display here because that's really her trademark <laughs> yeah so carissa's just her trademarks are always those really deep gouging cutbacks where she just you know ever since she was a little kid surfing in hawaii when she, um you know just that was her signature you know those big nice carved open face carbs um, a lot of style um, just uh, so much technique in her serving, which was just something that what I think a lot of young, younger girls can feed off of because it's, it's so important to learn all that, you know, right now, especially with the progressiveness in serving. Yeah, this is a very interesting matchup, and we're loving this showdown. Steph surfing her way from that fifth seed position. It's been a really tough run just to get to this point, and what a remarkable start she had to this first title match. Yeah, no, I knew as soon as... She, uh, it, I just knew she got through that first heat and, and that the fire would turn on. I mean, I know she always has a, a little bit of a problem with those first heats, the first heats in the morning or anything like that. The nerves are there. I just knew that once she got past that, then it was going to be hard to take her down. And I'm just excited to see these guys together in this match. This is what we all dreamt to see. Let's, I just want to see it go down, like bring the waves in. <laughs> you think it's going to a third heat or a third uh, match this one? I, wouldn't you want it to be? I, I mean, think so. What, yeah, let's do it. Great to have a chat with you, yeah. Lisa, and stick around. And let's crown some world champions today. It's going to be a great night. Back to you, Jack. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, so great to hear from a four-time world champ, Lisa Anderson, who spent a lot of time on this wave, uh, recently moved back to Florida, but she was right here in San Clemente surfing up and down the Trestles coastline. And I just love how she's so passionate about the world title showdown today. She's so invested in what Carissa's accomplished and what Steph has done, I'm sure. I mean, a true hero for both of you throughout your life. Oh, someone that's inspired me. I mean, throughout my, my surfing career, but even before as a little grom, someone that I've definitely looked up to. Um, and, you know, these two women inspiring other generations of, of female surfers. It's cool to watch the baton being handed over. For sure. I mean, I was an 11-year-old grom going to a Lisa Anderson champ camp in Hawaii. It was my first overseas trip, uh, and I got to stay with my heroes in Lisa. It was kept making me scrambled eggs and I was like what you just were on a poster on my wall and now you're making me eggs <laughs> but they came out of a little can so I was like I was tripping out I was like they don't come in a shell in America <laughs> Wow! but uh yeah anyway um yeah it was amazing and you know Lisa is you know a hero of mine and and like we say you know Carissa Moore does her more Aloha camps now and passing that baton down to just inspire the next generation and, and lift them up and yeah yeah, it's a lot that they put on, you know, with Carissa dedicating herself to the youth uh, back home on Oahu and also trying to prepare herself for a world title race again. And I think she's her own worst critic. I think that's why sometimes we're reading that a lot, uh, starting off the season in the final of Pipeline in a historical event. You know, going down early at sunset and was trying to really find a connection with the rhythm of trying to win again, finaling at Bells, and she was still right in the mix. She was never outside of a final five picture, but for her, we're just so expected her to have the trophy above her head, getting those number one results. Finally came in Brazil, was able to clinch this seed in back-to-back -back seasons here at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. And as we remember last year, it did go to a third and deciding title match against Tatiana so far. Things going in favor of Gilmore. She's up again. Steph feeling out that rail of the DHD. She'll throw the carve down and combo it up with a nice, clean finishing move. 
That'll be her second scoring ride. Getting close to the halfway mark. Chris is still holding priority. Yeah, that was interesting. That set just looking over our shoulders. Obviously, Steph had that opportunity. That second wave of the set was drawing so nicely off the cobblestones as we've seen this wind kind of kick up. You're really going to try and find that cleaner face as it draws off the reef. Steph really putting on the gas here, going for that trademark turn, trying to combo it up there and that wave running, running away from her. Feel good for Steph, you know, uh, opening up there so much rail, just, you know, navigating through the bumps there and cutting that short so she can try and get this uh, second turn in here and throwing the arms, those those uh, floaters there feels <laughs> very fun. But a 3.3, you know, she's going to put the pressure on, on uh, Carissa now and she's got to back up. It's fun because when I watch Steph and I watch those motions, you know, you, you kind of circle back to when she was a wild card, when she was 18 competing at Snapper Rocks. There's still those flashes of that same style, those same maneuvers that we're so used to. But right now it's just turned up to turn 11. Well, I think I might have just spotted one of the biggest fans here at Lower Trestles. Uh, Pete Mel, where are you watching the show? Oh, I had to find my way into the into the right of the cobblestones because you know why? It was going off here. Come on, we, you guys lost it. So oh, come on. Hey, and this is the vibe that's down here on the cobblestones. The low tide has opened up the bench, and you can see the Felipe fans are fired up for this next title match. And this is the kind of atmosphere that you have for the finals, and I love it. Absolutely love the froth of a Hall of Famer named Peter Mel getting right into the mix with a lot of the Brazilian storm energy. There's already so many different versions of hats being passed out to see where people are going to be deciding to go for Itala or Felipe within the Brazilian storm as their first title match is coming up next. Meanwhile, Gilmore throws a 5-2-7 at Carissa to build her total to 13.6 in title match number one in the World Champs matchup. We'll be right back. People falling from the sky. At least no one got hurt, that was good. I'm really happy no one got hurt. My Aussie accent making it really hard for me to say Tehupo. Kelly Slater is one of the best at Tehupo. I just can't say it. The correct way to say chops is Tehupo. 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 Oh, do you big man ass? Here comes Molly Pickle. Big swing. Front side hook. Rising Tides is a really cool initiative to bring the local girls down to meet the pros and basically give them a glimpse into what the tour life is like. This is our very first finals edition. Yeah, should we just take over Lola's? Just... A lot of Rising Tides is built from, you know, my own experience and meeting some of our professional surfers when I was a kid. I remember that moment and how important it was to me. There's something about meeting your heroes that makes your own dreams real tangible. All the little girls in yellow jerseys just took over the lineup at Lowers. And this crop of the next generation that's going to be champions. We've got Lisa Anderson here. She was a huge inspiration for me. So I'm hoping that that kind of same effect is happening right now and, and I'm able to be an inspiration for these young girls. I've been watching a few waves just now, and um, I'm really, really inspired by how good they are. It's kind of a proud moment, you know, I, I, I'm enjoying watching them surf. My short-term goals are to make the Challenger Series, and my long-term goals are to make the CT and the Olympics and fight for world titles and gold medals. Uh, we absolutely love the Groms here and all the Groms that participated in the WSL Rising Tides presented by Pura Vida. There's so much talent right here in San Clemente and Rosie, you get to see it each and every day. 
the young surfers just pushing the limits from young Remy Todd, uh, the Limblads. It's, it's they're pushing each other each and every time they surf. And I agree with with Chris Carissa there. There's world champions in the making right here at Lower Trestles. It is. It's so impressive. Every time I go away and I come back and I watch these young women take over the lineup, I'm just so impressed with them. And the next generation is so scary. I mean, we saw a glimpse of Erin Brooks there. She made the final at the Rip Curl, uh Pro at Padang Padang uh, in the men's field. And so there's just unbelievable surfers coming up the ranks that are going to take away world titles from Steph and Carissa. And it's uh, just directly related to how Steph and Carissa started. They were the Aaron Brooks's back then. They came in and changed the game. And when Steph came on, she appeared to be unbeatable. And she was still trying to finish high school. And it was like, OK, here comes the dynasty. And she's got seven, very close to eight now. Yeah, Steph, you know, just she came out of high school and she finished high school, actually. She, uh, everyone, you know, seems to think that Steph was, you know, competing quite, quite young. She was for the juniors, but she waited to finish high school and, and uh, she missed, uh, I think, some days at school to win that first uh, Roxy Pro on the Gold Coast. So great looking back and we've been flying through the day today. Let's catch up to Joanne DeFay with Louisa. Joanne. Not long ago, when I said congratulations for coming this far, you just told me, like, oh, today was such a roller coaster day for you. Can you explore this idea with us? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> we just like put so much time and, and hope in, into that day. I think um, it's been my second experience now, and um, and <laughs> it was 30 minutes, and then it's finished, you know. Um, it's hard and it's, um, how can I say, I don't think that he'd reflect my year, so it's a bit, it's a bit hard to like swallow. Um, so it's still my best year, but at the same time, like, fact, to do all of this, to actually do 35 minutes and blow it, it's pretty bad. But it's not blowing my whole year, so I need a bit of time to just like step back and, and enjoy also that, at, that year. But um, yeah, today was a pretty sad day for me. <laughs> I'm going to let you go and wrap your head around, but I really hope that you feel proud of yourself because we all are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Louisa. Always the tough ones when you're on the other side of, you know, the the great moment and the momentum win for Steph on the wrong side of that, Joanne DeFay, the heartbreak that she's still digesting. But what a stellar she, year she did have. Steph, though, opens up again here, Laura. Yes, yeah, Steph, you know, a bit of a frothier wave, but just getting a nice uh, string of turns in here. So this is definitely going to be better than her 3.33 and uh, really solidify her spot. But just having a lot of fun, you know, picking the right waves. She knows she's got, you know, a few more heats to surf against Carissa, but finishing off there with the dynamic blow to our layback. She's not looking fatigued. It's looking so energized, looking incredibly inspired, turning in the best numbers in this heat. She's got the 833 is the high mark. Her 527, second best way. Well, that's gone because now she has a 6.67. Carissa needs a 10 to take the lead on this wave. Big sweep for the Hawaiian. The defending world champ jams it quickly. She's going to have to hustle to get to that finish, places it well to ride out as she's still trying to build her momentum with 7.20 to go. Wow. So almost repeat feelings from last year, that first match for Carissa, trying to turn it on and trying to play catch up against Steph now, Rosie. Yeah, just finding that little bit of a warm up from Carissa. We have seen Steph kind of figure out the conditions and really surf into rhythm through the through the rounds, through the matches. But here you have Carissa, she's kind of chipping it away at it. So let's see how that one pans out. 6.55 on the clock, Strider. Steph, you're still with total control of this first title match. Yeah, just I was just honed in on watching her paddle by and looking at, you know, whether she was fatigued, where the mental side is, and, and how she was looking. And there's, I see no sign of fatigue. I just see nothing but lasers. She's got a, a pure stride coming through. There's no waver in her paddle. And as you saw her finish that last wave, it was pure power. And that's what I like to see. After working through that whole wave to finish that strong, Whatever she was doing up to this event, it's working, and I love watching it. We've seen Carissa, though. She's not done. She's never done, and she's coming back out right now. So I can't wait to see the rest of this thing go on. Sets are pumping, and it's, I just can't believe how hyped I am. This is so fun. Thank you so much, Strider. We're right there with you. Two of the best ever going head-to-head -head on one day where we're deciding our world title in the water. 
Carissa, back when we were in quarantine in Australia, said she wanted the match with Steph Gilmore in this brand new format. She's earned it, but she still got to turn in a huge result. I was almost anticipating from Carissa's experience last year that she was going to find a way to apply pressure early in this first title match. It, it feels like it might be the same scenario now, Rosie. Yeah, it does have that uh, kind of glimmer of the same shades of what we saw last season, but I also think it's a completely different animal. Last year, Carissa was coming up against Tatiana Westweb, who was looking for a maiden world title. So Carissa could flex. She has those world titles. She has the experience. Now she's coming up against Steph. They both have world titles. They both have the experience. So you almost get stripped of that little bit of kind of world title dominance. It's a very good point. I mean, we were kind of focusing as well on what happened earlier this year at Bells when mm -hmm. Steph went down to Carissa and kind of felt like she wasn't herself. But the, you know, the year before, Steph was undefeated against Carissa in Carissa's fifth world title year. So it's like it's a constant back and forth, the mental battle, the performance battle of two of the all-time greats. I love it. And it's just on the day, you know, like Carissa, if she, you know, can't get over Steph in this in this first round, uh, for first match, sorry, uh, she's she knows what to do. She's she can go back to that space that she was in with Tatiana and, and mentally, you know, come out firing into into the uh, second match. So, you know, she's been there before. That's that's one thing she can, you know, hold on to. Chris Moore has her dad upstairs, uh, keeping a close eye on everything going down. All her decision making, it's a common sight. He was down here when she was just a little kid, uh, winning all those national titles consecutively. Didn't have a whole lot of competition in those early years, and then those even got more intense with all the Hawaiian contingent from multiple finals with Coco Ho, Malia Madwell. Alana Blanchard and the rest of the crew and always meeting up with Courtney Conlog, Sage Erickson, all the Californians here and the East Coasters as well. For Carissa, it's like she doesn't really have to relearn how to surf a wave like this. It's it's pretty automatic when she gets in motion on a, a great trestles wall. Yeah, you'd have to say Carissa has the most experience at lowers. And even watching their preparation, um, Carissa's been here for a few days going out free surfing, really just re-immersing herself in the lineup. Steph, on the other hand, I only saw her one or two days before the event, I don't know, free surfing. So I think she was down uh, up in Malibu, like Little Doom and, and getting some reps on those because it has been south wall. So a lot of the point breaks have been working, but Chris has been out at lowers surfing this break. And it's like how you manage your time. Yeah, for Tommy Whitaker, Steph's coach, she was like, okay, she managed it well. Her surfs looked great yesterday, but then really wanted to apply a very cruisy day ice bath, sauna program, early dinner, and just make sure that all the energy could be spent today. Steph's kind of at that time now, Laura, where now she's in the title match. She can leave everything out there now. This is the everything she's worked so hard for throughout the day today. For sure. I mean, we look back and, uh, you know, just the, the whole progression of her surfing throughout today has been unbelievable. And I think what she has over Carissa right now is that the lineup isn't necessarily an easy trestles lineup you know we've got a bit of wind on the face but steph has been able to find that little sweet spot and i actually like i saw tom whittaker and, and we were talking about you know her finding these smaller waves and and really finding you know her rhythm on these on these little waves that she was could surf perfect on and uh i think that's what she's got over chris right now just the wave selection really well done dynamic decision making as well and starting much earlier than she did when she uh, could have been flustered against Brisa Hennessy came back in a heroic moment we had Brisa lose priority called on a block and it gave Gilmore a chance and that has just lit the fire for the seven time world champ decision time with 215 to go Carissa doesn't have priority so Gilmore will take this wave it's out in front Front side hook, and she's out of there. Ooh, that was an interesting sell by Carissa for that wave. I mean, we're talking about how Car Steph's been able to pick off the cleaner faces. That one was pretty chattery up the face. So Steph relinquishing that priority to Carissa at a crucial time. Impressive. We're talking about how great your wave selection is, and Carissa has that ability to kind of force the hand. That job well done. Now she's giving herself a shot. A 9.10 is the requirement. As we're down to 90 seconds, Carissa might be looking for it now. Remember, she's done a lot of things in the high nines, especially above the lip. A lot of training with surfers like Shane Beshin here at Lowers to really focus on big ramps, big sections above the lip. But time is against her in this first title match. One minute, 15 seconds to go. 
Inhale, exhale, right? Like just waiting for that opportunity. There's nothing you can do. There's no control over the ocean when that wave's going to come your way. So Carissa's kind of just got to keep that peaceful mental attitude and, and save the rage for the wave. She does that so incredibly well into the final minute. Remember, best of three series here for the title match. And what an advantage that would be for Stephanie Gilmore if she takes the first. 40 seconds to go. Carissa trying to find some space. We've seen one maneuver sections highly rewarded, but it's just really trying to find something to work with. Not a whole lot heading her way. Little bump potentially now for Carissa. 25 seconds. And she just has to sit on her board and stare out into the horizon. We rotate the title matches with the men, so there's going to be a little bit of a debrief moment for Carissa Moore to try to salvage her season here at the Rip Crow WSL Finals. So Stephanie Gilmore has just taken the first match over Carissa Moore in the best of three series to have the advantage going into title match number two. I just had like that hot in your throat moment just watching this go down. Steph, potentially one heat away from her eighth world title. I wow. mean, Carissa's got to turn it around. A record-breaking moment <laughs> potentially for Stephanie Gilmore. Tied with Lane with seven, and now Carissa under pressure. She's in a must-win situation for the rest of the day. As we check out the title match here, Steph Gilmore getting the first, and it was really with that jump start, getting that eight ranger, 15-point total. Never looked like she was going to lose that one, Laura. Yeah, you know, that first wave was everything. It was, yeah, you know, the, the best wave of the heat. Carissa and her were jockeying for position, and, you know, that made the difference in the end. The girls had, uh, you know, Similar second scoring uh, backup waves, but that eight just shot that, shot Steph into that lead. Those first two frontside power carves, Steph Gilmore just put that on the line to start. It almost looked like she could have been tentative through the morning, but now she's firing at all cylinders, peaking at the right time. She is peaking at the right time, but I don't feel like Steph has been tentative today. I do feel like she's been really pushing throughout, but I do feel she's gone to another gear in the final matchups, which is even more exciting for us to just gorge ourselves on this action. I love it. And looking at those falls she had this morning, uh, maybe it's just a, a rhythm thing. Like you're seeing, hey, that's pushing. She's fighting for it, not holding back. And for her now, getting into the excellent range, getting the first off Carissa. I mean, how does Moore walk away from that and manage a loss and still remind herself that she's got the Hydro Flask leader's jersey right now? Well, she did it last year against Tatiana, so she's going to be going back to that mental space, just, you know, you know, getting her team around her. They're just going to debrief, talk about the waves. You know, the wave selection at the end of the day was what let, uh, you know, Carissa down and that strategy at the start of the heat. So maybe she's going to try to start with the inside for the next heat and, you know, we're just going to see what happens. Exactly. Just a quick moment to regroup when your entire season's on the line. Uh, not a lot of surfers <laughs> can even relate to this <laughs> matter at hand. <laughs> Chris is the one that went through it last year, and we'll see if she can bounce back. Let's now send it to the beach with Chris Cote. Are you ready, surf fans? It's time for the men's title matches. Surfing all the way from match one from by Formosa, Brazil, your 2019 world champion in the green jersey, Italo Ferrara. And your current number one seed wearing the yellow Hydro Flask Leaders jersey from Ubatuba, Brazil, by way of San Clemente, California, number 77, Felipe Tele. Felipe Toledo trying to establish himself as a world champion. He's been trying to do that since he qualified back in 2013. The stage is set for the first match. All Brazilian, Felipe Versitolo coming up next. Lisa Anderson, Lane Beachley and Stephanie Gilmore are three rare beings who set their sights beyond simply winning world titles. Sure, between them, they've taken home 40% of all women's world titles ever handed out. But through their careers, they didn't only shatter records, they shattered ceilings, feelings, and decades of barriers.
Their success didn't help push for equality. It demanded it, fostering parity in pay, events, coverage, attention, and spawning the modern women's talent boom. What? She surprised herself. <laughs> they made a generation of girls realize women's pro surfing was a viable path and inspired them to follow in their immense footsteps. Their impact will be unmistakable at the 2022 Rip Curl WSL Finals. My job is professional surfer. My goal is to win titles. That's what I'm here for. The world's best surfers in the world's best waves. We've had a shark attack. Whoa. It's the most intense surfing scenario you can imagine. I have to step up my game now and not make any mistakes. Oh my god! <laughs> this is a war. You have to find a way to win it and do it at all costs. Hi, we're the WSL. We travel all over the world, chasing the best waves and surfing the nicest beaches. But we don't just surf. We're also doing our best to protect the thing we love most by restoring coasts, stopping plastic pollution, and reducing climate impacts. We know we're not the only ones trying to save the ocean, so we want to hear what you're up to. Use hashtag WeAreOneOcean and tag WSL to share your sustainability story. Boom! Bangs that hard! One more whack! Oh. Toledo goes for massive rotation. It is buttery smooth. And now a champion at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, Felipe Toledo. One big move, and oh my goodness, that was crazy. Felipe Toledo, your champion of the Oi Rio Pro. Italo, he's got that look to him. Spring loaded, tail high, full rotation oh, punt. Italo Ferreira trying to do the impossible, coming from match number one. If anyone's going to go the distance and have the energy, I mean, Italo has so much in the tank. <laughs> An all-Brazilian matchup to decide the men's world champion today. Felipe Toledo wearing the Hydro Flask leader's jersey for a dominant season, his best of his career, and the closest he's ever been in a position to clinch that first world title. Italo Ferrer, as we know, came down with one of the greatest finishes in our sports history with winning in the water over Gabriel Medina at Pipeline to take out his first world title. He returned in his world title defense last year to the Rip Curl WSL Finals and went down to Felipe Toledo on the day. And now a rematch that he's been waiting for for one year as the horn goes off. Felipe versus Italo, these conditions we're going to already see the start. Ferreira setting that sight on a ramp on the left as he goes down. I'm, I'm pretty sure, Rosie, you were expecting that. I, wa I wasn't expecting him to go down. I was definitely expecting the ramp. I mean, Italo, all day he's been building to this moment. You know, we've seen him. He's kind of fizzing like someone's thrown a Mentos in him and he's just like <laughs> exploding out of himself as he runs to the water. But yeah, it's crazy. I mean, to watch how the guys progress to this final matchup with uh, Felipe, both Brazilians. I mean, this is all time. And it's ominous when you look at the jersey colors right now, just reflecting the Brazilian flag with Italo coming in as one of the tough seeds from the bottom in the first match at number four. He had to deal with all the big hitters from Kanoa this morning. And Felipe Toledo's just been standing by, waiting to get started here on what you call his home break. You know, living in San Clemente for, for quite some time now, Laura. Yeah, Felipe, you know, he, he knows this wave. You know, we've seen Italo today. He's he's has an amazing relationship right now. He's been able to catch like 30 to 40 waves out there. He's how I don't understand how he's got so much energy, but he's doing it and he's uh, he's continuing to go and catch a lot of waves and do some crazy surfing. But Felipe knows this wave. He surfs here. This is his sec second home or home now. And we're seeing him take off. Felipe Toledo setting up his opener here at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Wrap to start. Off the bottom, big blitz off the lip with the fin throw. Jamming down the line. Total control on some messy sections for Toledo. Winds up and punches out the finish with authority. No warm up required for Felipe. <laughs> it's all about that opening exchange for me, just to assess how people are feeling. I mean, we haven't seen Felipe all day, but just to see his confidence on that opening ride, he's 
he's making a statement. There's so many things that can get in your head on the lead up to a big day like today. Everyone knows he's the favorite, knows he's in this great position. He's done such a great job in the lead up to manage that energy and using it when he needs it the most. That was an impressive start, Laura. What'd you like about it? What an amazing start. You know, had a bit of bump on the face here, but Felipe just navigating this first section. And this was where he got to throw the tail so far, so whippy again, just getting so much progression and speed down the line. And this was the turn that I loved, slashing and laying back just so fast, the Felipe that we are just picking up where, where he put down last year out here. Both these guys, total showman. The flex riding away, that just builds Felipe's confidence. I think the velocity too. I mean, every section that he came to meet, he just threw himself at it, that power and just the confidence. And one of my favorite waves of the men's draw so far. I mean, just looking at the way that, that he opened this, uh, this matchup up. So yeah, I'm, I'm just so impressed and I'm frothing. These guys can turn messy sections into miracles on demand. You know, they've been in finals at Super Tubos in Portugal where no one even knew where to surf and they're throwing down huge alley-oops and big punts, getting tens and nines. They can build momentum even with nothing out there. And now they've got a great rippable lineup at lower trestles. Felipe will turn in a 7-5 to take off with the advantage over Italo Ferreira at the start of this heat, Laura. Wow, that must feel amazing for Felipe. You know, we haven't seen him down here all day. He's just been staying at home in his zone, probably not watching what's going on. It'll be interesting to know what he was doing in, uh, you know, the lead up to this moment right now, but he is on. And like you were saying, Rosie, that was a statement way to say, hello, I am here. I am in this uh, Hydro Flask yellow jersey and I am number one. That's exactly what he just did. Let's go into the equipment talk with Peter Mel. Yeah, that's right. Right, Joe, I wanted to touch on, we haven't seen Felipe all day long, but we do see a familiar style of surfboard under his feet. We see the dark arts, the forefin is under his feet like we saw last year. It's not the same board, but an updated version. It's got the H4 FCS 2s on it, the same style of fins he was riding. So he's going back to that magic that we saw last year. They almost got the title, but this time he wants it. 100% P, yeah, you're using on that reliable equipment that worked so incredibly well last year. I know there was a lot of people ordering those boards after Felipe's performance. That swallowtail with a quad, it, you know, has been around for a while at lowers. Uh, Kelly won out here on a version of that back in 2012. CJ Hobgood won an event out here on that swallowtail quad shaped by Bill Johnson back in the day. But then adding the dark arts technology, that's been the secret weapon for Toledo. 7-5, Italo, 0.83, holding down priority. He's the one man that kind of popped out on the draw. If anyone could have the energy to survive a day like today, it could be Italo as he's looking curious about the left. He will commit. Looking for a first ramp, tail high, stomps a reverse. Sets up the float on the windup again. Front side wrapping cutback, jams the fins out. Forces a reverse on the end section. That's how creative he can be. Did a lot of different types of moves as well from start to finish. That's going to set up Felipe for his forehand. Toledo, first turn, a dynamic one in the pocket. Out in front, absolute layback dagger. Front side wrap again. Toledo looking perfect through that last wrap. And he'll Ooh. slip off. First mistake, and might have been a painful one. Checks his wax quickly. And he's just going to shake that one off. As hard as he pushes, that thing belted him. And before he got to that point, though, he was surfing perfectly. Every turn was powerful. It was dynamic, as he still is favored at the start of this matchup, Laura. He could be missing a tooth, but he would not care right now. <laughs> he's uh, he's on fire, and that was yeah. You know, that, I think that's still going to come in as a, a pretty high score. That was that second turn. I think was just unbelievable. Italo though can't wait to see that that replay as well, going to the air, and you know the different strategies we're seeing from these guys. Rosie, here you go. Well, you know, thinking about the strengths from Italo and identifying a point of difference, you're going to go to his forehand with this wind, with the variety that he can throw in, just smoothing through those turns and throwing something critical on that opening maneuver has been the point of difference for Italo uh, throughout these matchups and throughout the day. But Felipe, this wave was so smooth on the open face. 
Unbelievable start there, Laura. What about out in front? That was the turn. That was unbelievable. It was frothy at the start, but you know it stood up and just had that nice, clean wall with a, you know a lot of energy. Fizzled out here, and uh, he just wanted to get some work done. That's where he has no front teeth left. But uh, it's oh, and you could see he didn't get the hands up in time, so he felt every bit of that slip Maybe. right to the upper. on the old wax today. Also on this tide being shallow, if you step on the rocks real quick, you can get that slime on your feet. A tough fall for Felipe, but he'll probably like the score. Steph Gilmore got the first win in, in match number one in the title match against Carissa. She's hanging out with Kaipo. Steph, you're one up right now. How are you going to close this thing out for a world title? Just do what I did again. Um, but yeah, Carissa did this last year. She Lost the first one and she came back super strong, so I'm sure she'll do that again. But I'm feeling good. The energy level's still there. There's not too many waves, so I, I feel like I can conserve my energy pretty good and wait for a good one and do my thing. See you in the next match. Steph Gilmore all focused on one more heat that could potentially change our story in surfing history. Interesting. Uh, you never, you've never really seen a surfer maybe wish for less waves out there, but you know that's her strategy now to conserve energy. And when the the best waves come, yeah, there's only two of them be on the on the best waves. So, yeah, Steph seems like she's got some energy. Steph Gilmore has ridden 25 waves today, coming from the first title match, and still feeling fired up. And interesting to note, Italo hasn't caught up to her yet. He's coming from the first match. He's got 21 waves ridden so far. As I remember a heat draw from Newcastle one year, I looked at Etil, he got 17 waves in one heat. He's wow. so energetic. Last year he did some work with Mike Parsons, a local legend here, and Mike was just joking with me, but he's like, my hardest job is keeping him out of T-Street all day. Just <laughs> He just wanted to surf a thousand times, ride all of his boards. I think for Etil, he embraces this. He'd, he'd rather not be sitting and waiting. He just wants to get, get started. Even when he's on the glass, he's like foot to foot. You can't stop the guy from moving. He's <laughs> always like on the hustle. So yeah, in the water, no different. But it's crazy that Steph's had more waves than him. Yeah, she's been doing the hard yards. Coming after those falls in the morning, felt like it was ominous from last season. And that's just out the window because she is making perfect decisions and leads over Carissa Moore. Their second title match coming up next. If Steph wins it, History will be made with an eighth world title. If Carissa gets it, we'll go to a third and final deciding title match later on this afternoon. Crowd filling up quickly. A Brazilian dynasty led by Medina back in 2014, passed it to Adriano de Souza in 2015. We got to see Italo get in the mix. Medina got to mention three world titles as well. Felipe said he found so much motivation when the Brazilian storm started winning. That's where he found the belief in himself to become a world title threat. Speaking of legends and world champions, Tommy Carroll saying it with Ronnie Blakey. Thank you, Joe. Tom. Yeah, yes, mate. Uh, so good watching this first match play out between Felipe and Italo, and you were out of your seat grunting and moaning <laughs> as Felipe deconstructed that first ride. Uh, he's on. He's on. You can see the freshness in, you know, and his actual passion. I just love seeing what he does on the rail. And he's brought a real freshness to the whole show, hasn't he? He sure has, yeah. Mm. His flow, his mm. variety are mm. incredible. But Italo, a remarkable run mm. for, from him to get from fourth into this position to chase a second world title and equal you. <laughs> well, here he comes. But it's going to happen. By the, by the sound of it, no matter what, whether today happens for him or not, he's just got that. You can see, see the energy that's coming from Italo from way back. Because sometimes you go, yeah, it's radioactive. <laughs> so today you can see just he he can do these sort of lengthy days of surfing. I got to get you. plenty of strength. Sorry, I got to get your take on, on Stephanie Gilmore's run so far in this contest, coming in mm. as the number five seed, an eighth world title, one heat away for her. What do you think? Wow, Steph. Well, Steph, you can see how she's built up from the, you know, against uh, Brissa. You know, she had a little shaky start, probably had a lot on her mind. You can see it's sort of shaky. And then as she sort of gathered herself, particularly the end of that heat, and really lifted herself the second heat when she came, you know, Tatiana and so on, it was just, she just dug in and started to get a flow. Once, once she starts to feel it, you know, I know her level of froth because we've connected in the one before.
I could see her just sort of gathering it together and just harnessing it, and it just started to play out. And she's got the stamina. You know, Steph has the stamina. She's grew up on these points, surfing Queensland points all her life, and that, that takes a lot of stamina. So she's got it. She made that point, though, that uh, Carissa did come back last year against Tatiana, won the second and third match to get her fifth world title. There's so many world champions around, which is fantastic to see. Four surfers left in the mix, battling it out for the crown, and whoever wins uh, is obviously going to be very deserving of that honour. We've got three world champions in there already. Felipe Toledo, though, it would be fitting to see him break through for a maiden world title, the, the surfing that he's done. Uh, ever since he joined the championship tour ranks. Well, you'd have to think, you know, uh, reflect on how much he's offered up surfing over the last, well, from he started, the time he started, but for the particular last 10 years and what he's brought to the sport and how he's lifted everyone. He just hasn't just one, he's just lifted everyone along the way. From that win. And here he and goes. here he goes now from that win at Jay Bay in 2018. He was so dominant and now he's really looking on fire here just feeling it. it's like how's that you give him the balls right <laughs> so, <laughs> so but he is it low it's low it's gonna take a time. fall there but yeah it is a, it's an amazing level that, that felipe brings to competition especially in big heats it's a huge moment for him he is pegged as the favorite even if he wasn't the number one seed i think the surfing that he's done this year would put him in that position but he's got to start completing these rides mate absolute pleasure having a chat with you and uh, looking forward to celebrating this afternoon yeah absolutely right good to see you it's great to be here it's really all right special. back to you guys in the booth to take us through the remainder of this first matchup in the men's division ronnie tommy we loved every bit of that catch-up so awesome to hear the fire out of two-time world champ tommy carroll enjoying the show back to felipe laura what'd you love about that first turn well he threw so much spray uh, absolutely amazing <laughs> by felipe here that first turn was uh, just so spot on he just knows this wave so well just connecting the dots and unfortunately going down on that final uh blow tail reverse there but uh wow he just knows all the sweet spots out here doesn't he he certainly does and that turn is so radical he does it in his sleep Italo on the one behind row yeah Italo, you know trying to get some work done he's probably hearing all the noise on the beach for the Italo camp i mean for the toledo camp and there his foot comes undone on that maneuver just flicks it out on that little bit of bump the fins disengage Italo has been such a warrior ever since he learned how to win, beating Mick Fanning in an emotional ceremony because it was Mick's uh, retirement event. And Italo changed the script when it was in front of an all-Australian crowd and Italo got his first win and he instantly took that as confidence and momentum. Now multiple victories. He was into his world title defense last year. He didn't really hesitate with big numbers as we see him throw away a punt on the left again. But it was interesting this year when he started missing finals, when he was kind of stuck in a lot of seven scores when he needed eights. Uh, this has probably been one of the more challenging years for him to compete on since he kind of took over the world, where he had to kind of relook at his surfing and kind of talk to the judges a few times to see what they're really expecting out of him, Laura. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this year's been uh, interesting. We haven't seen uh, Italo in that final situation or winning events like we're used to seeing. But, uh, you know, for him to be here in this world title matchup, he's been consistent enough and had, you know, moments of brilliance throughout the year. You know, uh, just, you know, third at, uh, at Jay Bay and you know he's had some amazing results so I mean his surfing is unbelievable but yet yeah, I think he can take a lot away from this year no matter what I think it adds that extra fire I think for both of these guys we saw Felipe lose out in really close finals um, you know against Griffin and against Jack at uh, G land so he's got fire coming in wanting to prove something wanting to lift the level and really prove you know his points of his surfing and how it should be judged and it's low like we said yet to make a final this season and and really trying hard to get in that excellent range so it's pretty fun to see that little extra fire and how it uh shows in their surfing Italo coming off the left again just forcing a quick little fade there on the left he's really just ramp hunting now He'll go above the lip quickly controls the tail waft no reverse there pulls it forward reverses the second version and now ramping up the, another quick little tail out and he'll get stuck just trying to find a big ramp section to go a bit higher above the lip as you see he's just trying to find little pieces of that left to work with to really spring load into the sky 
Yeah, this, that this matchup's incredible. You're thinking about it further. You know, Felipe's got four straight wins on Italo, you know, including the title match uh, that they had last season. So it's, he's had quite a role against Italo in the more recent seasons. Laura, what do you think here? Yeah, no, this wave just looked like uh, the wind was sort of playing havoc. He was just waiting for this to wall up, almost lost it there at the start. But as you can see, it went flat and you knew here he was going to look for the ramp. That bowly section there kind of felt a little bit forced here, like he was just trying to make something happen, you know, spinning it around there. But uh, going for the third one here, but unfortunately not able to hang on. But a lot of a lot of bump and a lot of uh, stuff to navigate there for Italo. Itala turns in a 4.83, his best a 6.0. So still needing an 8.4 to catch up to Toledo. Toledo still with 17 minutes on the clock as he finished runner up in the world last year to Gabriel Medina. Medina got his third title. Uh, Felipe said he paddled straight up to him last year and just told him, hey, you deserve this season. Uh, they've got a special relationship, and we actually got to follow through with that relationship when Medina returned to the jersey after taking a little bit of a break. And they were kind of inseparable. And those conversations and Medina sending him messages saying that he's cheering for him has really fired up Felipe this season. Yeah, that's that's so special, and that's something I've seen, you know, the every season but the camaraderie between the Brazilians and I do feel like Felipe stepped into that role of kind of being the dad he's taken that role of like taking everyone under his wing really making sure everyone's down at the beach supporting being the guy that's on the beach to cheer people um, to cheer people up when they win so um, and obviously when they lose too he's kind of that guy that they can be a sounding board with so it's just cool to see how that has kind of lifted everyone's spirits and really uh, created just this cool community feeling as we see the number 77 clear across trestles today all rooting for this man as they want him to win his first world title today felipe on the wind up clean wrap to start already a ton of speed quick speed jam climbs the next section he can catch up to anything out here extended tail drift big float right into a redirect off the top and will he shut it down? His finishes have been tough, not this time. Slams it shut. Felipe looking to better a 6.9 with that effort. And with a couple of falls on the final turn on his previous waves, you could definitely see him lining it up to force the finish. Great read there for Felipe, Laura. Yeah, that was a great read. It was a hard wave to surf. It felt like he was chasing a lot of it, but he got a lot of work done. I feel like usually when you're chasing a you know a wall down like that, it, it is quite hard to get some uh, you know big turns in. But Felipe just knows exactly where to uh, you know put his board, and he surfed this really well. A nice opening gouge there, and just here he realised he had to <laughs> make some uh, make a move down the line and. Even his floaters and foam climbs are just throwing so much speed. Blow tail right there. And then finishes off here with a nice big wrapping curve. So yeah, a lot of a lot of chasing down this wave, but the way he connected that those dots was uh, pretty pretty wild. Back to the form that kicked it all off with that top turn. A lot of surfers here at Lowers wouldn't have gotten the distance. Felipe proving that he's the fastest surfer on the planet. He is the fastest, but I think Laura also just uh, mentioning the sweet spot. That's what Felipe is tapping into. Every time on a wave, he's able to find the lip line, whether he's coming from behind or, or kind of carving down, he's able to keep that flow and the speed and, and showing us uh, points of difference and obviously a lot of variety. It'll be interesting to see what this score comes in as, uh, you know, there wasn't any, you know, major sort of turns besides that big curve, but, you know, every one of those connecting maneuvers was uh, was done with speed, power, flow, and a hell of a lot of spray thrown in the air. Yeah, all <laughs> the variety as well, and then the risk factor. When, when he does a blow tail, it's like his whole board's out the back. Yeah. And I think there was times where sometimes people didn't know how to score him in the early days. He do something so big, and he made it look so easy. Sometimes you're always wondering if it could have gone higher. Toledo will take this number as the best number so far of title match number one, a 7.63 to go with his 7.5. Ferreira is now chasing a 9.13 in this all Brazilian matchup to decide our world champion this afternoon. We'll be right back in San Clemente, California after this.
still feeling like I'm a whole person without needing to win is, a, is a really important human experience. Especially because you've had an unusual amount of winning. Imagine if your life was a movie, what would you do? After all this time, I almost want people to experience it, this story that I've had. To properly meditate, it should probably be like, oh. Um... The Rip Curl WSL Finals is brought to you by Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company. By Oakley, official eyewear of the World Surf League. By Flying Embers, official hard kombucha of the World Surf League. By Expedia, made to travel, the WSL's official travel booking partner. And by Turtle Bay, official resort of the World Surf League. The biggest day in pro surfing continues here at the Rip Curl WSL final. Still enjoying the first title match with Felipe Toledo and Italo Ferreira. Priority with Italo chasing down a 9.13 as we're also standing by for a title match. Heat number two, Carissa Moore in a must win situation to try to save her sixth world title campaign. She's got five, but she can't lose. For the rest of the day, Steph Gilmore just took the first, the best of three series. And they're back in the water coming up next. Wow, that's coming up quick. And you see Carissa kind of resetting. They're getting ready for that matchup. Similar situation to last season. And we know what Carissa is capable of. Mitchell Ross is such an incredible coach uh, for Carissa Moore. Basically like family taking uh, some sweet time right now just to put the right words in her head. So she's going to be incredibly confident in this next heat. We've got waves on the way. Italo Ferreira rolls in. Now checking out the lowers right. Cool little backhand wrap. Nice little power hack for Italo. Back to the lip again. Driving into the section. Blows half the board out the back. Controls it. Taps the white water as Felipe is loading up. Italo will finish. No turns for Toledo as he's out. I really like how Italo kind of changed gears a bit there, Laura. Just, you know, running after some messy laughs. That right was exactly what he needed. That was exactly what he needed. I think he identified the, that those lefts, uh, they were choppy and they were hard to surf. And, you know, his air attempts hadn't been successful. So time to uh, change it up. And that was, that was the best, uh, in my opinion, the best wave of his heat. Also to get variety the way he did on the conditions that we have today, not easy to do, Rosie. What'd you see? Well, I just like the, the critical, the crispness in his surfing, the way that he wait, waited right on the bottom before he flicked that tail out. So cool to see this different um, shadow and approach from Italo. So quick off the top and bottom. I know we've been talking about Toledo speed, but this guy to keep it in the pocket, not, you know, fly out in front of the face and, and get lateral was just impressive to me. 9.15 to go. Oftentimes, we got to break down the wave selection. Strider, how's the wave selection going in your point of view? Uh, you know what? It's a, there's a lot of wind out here, and it's coming across the face. So, you know, the, what's happening is, is that first wave comes through and kind of cleans up the lineup. I like to call it pulling the sheets tight. And as you can see, Toledo on the wave of the set right now, going beautiful. Catch up to Strider in a moment there as he is just frothing through every single turn. Toledo still looking perfect with his form, his technique, being in the right sections. His balance of finesse with power and variety is second to none. Two important scores to filter in in title match number one with still 8.25 to go. Being in the right place at the right time for Toledo. He does surf out here, obviously living in town, but he's actually, he sometimes surfs random waves. He just likes kind of having his personal space. And he's nothing really he has to learn about a wave like this since he's won so many times in the past. I can confirm that. I have seen him 
out in the water when I've been on the worst peak up and down the beach and he's out there with me and I'm like, what are you doing here? You could be getting <laughs> set at lowers. But, you know, I'm looking at Felipe and I'm, I'm coming to mind how many times this guy has been in a world title race. How many times has he seen, you know, that dream kind of slip through his fingers. Right now, the ultra confidence that he's exuding, I'm just, uh, you know, it, it all comes from that experience, from, you know, being at that bottom and having to pick yourself up again and build that momentum up. I'm just getting, you know, such good vibes from him. It's such a true story. Uh, Sally Fitzgibbons, one of the best ever, who is always chasing a world title, and who's back next year, by the way. She said it, sometimes it just gets part of your DNA. Then that becomes part of your psyche of this person who's almost got it. And then the defeats, you have to wear them and use them, hopefully to your advantage, to do it time and time again, where Toledo's been managing that really well, uh, decompressing in those off seasons. We've seen the tears, we've seen the blood, the sweat that he's put into this. He's even been opening up about mental health through this process of carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders at times. Yeah, no one wants the title of the best surfer to have never won a world title. You know, you only get like this window of opportunity and how many times can you kind of reinvent yourself and keep up with the level that we're seeing um, surfing evolve to every year? Every year with all the ups and downs and travels and formats and injuries, it's like you have a chance and you don't want to waste it. Felipe's not it, not wasting any time with his start, but Italo just got himself back into the heat. Going right, got an eight. Now needs a 7-1-3. One, one more score to lock in for Toledo to see if he can increase his lead to ditch a 7.5. But kind of had that moment that maybe we felt earlier this morning, the Brees to Steph matchup when Steph got her best wave and you're like, oh, hang on, now this is doable. Etil is probably feeling that right now. For sure, he'd take a lot of uh, inspiration from Steph. You know, that would be like the fellow first round, uh, first matches into the uh, final round. So incredible from, you know, feet from both of those. But uh, I mean, Felipe, you look at his year, five finals, two wins. He's just been un unbelievable. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, he, he's just the, the man to beat right now. And just the story of the Brazilian region dominating the sport of surfing on the men's side completely. And 88 world champ Barton Lynch kind of reflected on it earlier when we were hanging with him at Sunset Beach. It reminded him of his era of the Aussies being household names and all trading a lot of different world titles. As we have Italo rushing down the line, comes off the whitewater section. Big blast there, still needs a 7.13. How quick was that transition? Back to the lip again. He's got an inside bowl to work with. Great read. Incredible series of backhand snaps, even into this little one-foot section. He's putting this thing to bed. Wondering if he still had energy. Well, there it is. Snap to slide. Controls the finish. He said, everybody settle down. I'll, I'll give all the energy here in the water. Felipe did not improve on his previous wave, so Italo needs a 7-1-3 for the lead change. Yeah, Felipe left the door wide open there, and uh, look at that. In a, in a few minutes, Italo has climbed his way back into this match, and uh, you know, an eight-point ride, he only needs a 7.13. Let's see this replay. It was uh, a bigger set. Only one of these, so Felipe did not get the one behind, but, uh, you know, getting some work done. Nothing criti too critical at the start here, but working down, throwing a buckets of spray there and just keeping it tight in the pocket. This is where he just goes and does a hundred turns and, you know, nothing too critical. So I'm not sure how high they're going to go here. The wave goes quite small, but look at him go. Just that is... That is some wild surfing. So <laughs> intense for Italo to put himself back in the game. We're standing by for a score to see if he'll take the lead. But Strider, how do you break down the way he compresses on the right there? I think all core strength. We know he's got the energy and he's not going to give up, do or die. He wants that world title. And he was just succession of vertical slams in the lip line. Every time, I, you know, he would just come up and you just see nothing but board and fins and spray, just Christmas trees on every turn. And when he got to the inside, you saw the posture. There's so much involved and so much emotion and so much energy coming out of him right now. I love to see that kid fighting back and he wants that second world title beyond belief. 100% was what an incredible warrior and Italo Ferreira surfing through a lot of big names today through the Australian contingent Ethan Ewing Jack Robinson 
Kanoa Igarashi in the first match earlier this morning. And now really trying to hand it to world number one. Scores now drifting in. Ooh. They drop the high and the low. Memory needs a 7.13. So we've got one no there. Two no's. How's the average? Just under. Wow. 6.97 just misses the lead change and you can't believe it. Wow. I think, uh, you know, the lack of variety in, in those turns is what, you know, left, you know, kept that score down. But I mean, Italo just put it all out on the line there. That would have taken a lot of energy to do that amount of serving and the amount of turns that he did. The wave got pretty small at the end there, and I think, you know, the judges, yeah. Took that into account. Yeah, the end section of the wave, he belted it a million times. And you could tell, a split decision. Some judges are saying, yeah, that's enough to turn the heat. It's that close right now. Two minutes and nine seconds. Such an advantage if you can get that first win. Strider, it felt like from our view, Italo was pretty upset he didn't get the lead change. Oh my gosh, it was so, I was just going off of the, you know, my replay in my mind, blowing him up, thinking about it. And I turn around, he was right next to me. And then the, the, the score got thrown out there while he was right next to me. And he just looked over at me and just looked at the judges in disgust. And, like, and it was, I just loved the emotion out of him. He wanted the score. I he thought he got the score and he didn't get it. He just, and then he started paddling twice as fast, motoring out towards Toledo. I love it. Unbelievable. And he's still got to conserve his energy because he's still in there with a the fight. Minute 25. It's weird how we've seen that a few times this year, that reaction of not getting the lead from Italo. And hopefully for himself, that won't define his year. For sure. But also noting, you know, Felipe, as they were reading that squad, he kind of put his head down and just kind of, you know, let that news settle in that that lead hadn't changed, you know, because he was looking back over his shoulder, watching Italo, throwing bucks of spray to the sky, thinking that there was potentially that lead change. So him hearing that score, he kind of, uh, you know, dodged, dodged a, a, you know, a heat change right there. For sure, and look, these guys are going to be nice and close now. Felipe just sticking to Italo to make sure that he has no more opportunities with 40 seconds to go. Toledo needing to win two of these best of three series. So far with the lead in this one with 35 seconds to go. Finishing up runner-up in the world last season. Five finals, two wins. Losing some of those finals in very close decisions this year putting in all the sacrifices to prepare for his ultimate dream. Italo obviously still energetic, even though time's against him in this first title match. Impressive how he really built into a high gear. And if he loses this heat, he'll lose with the high single score. But maybe we'll get one more shot. Three seconds. And using priority to get the first win. Title match heat number one. Felipe Toledo, 7-6-3 and a 7-5. Wow, that one got incredibly close. That was a fun heat to watch unfold. I mean, the fight back from Italo was impressive, but Felipe, he's coming in with so much confidence. I love it. Really impressed. Felipe now needs one more win to become a world champion as we see him heading into the second title match with Italo Ferreira. Italo in a must-win situation so he could fight for a second world title. But will it be Toledo's day? He can simplify it into one more win, and he'll accomplish his first world title. Coming up next, title match sheet number two against the world champions. Stephanie Gilmore is one win away of accomplishing an eighth. We'll see if she can do it right after this. For the first four decades of the world tour, Brazil was on the rise, but had yet to produce a world champion. That all changed in 2014 when Gabriel Medina staked his claim and planted the Brazilian flag at the peak of pro surfing. He won Brazil's first world title and broke open the gates, ushering in the current era of pure progression. Not only did his coronation create a new world order, it declared his and Brazil's brand of high octane surfing as the new standard. The message was clear, push the limits or get left behind.
Here he goes, Medina's first wave of the final, super deep in pipe, and comes out. His influence will be seen all across the 2022 Rip Curl WSL Finals. People falling from the sky. At least no one got hurt, that was good. I'm really happy no one got hurt. Yeah. My Aussie accent is making it really hard for me to say Te Hupo. Kelly Slater is one of the best at Te Hupo. I just can't say it. The correct way to say chops is Te Ahupo. Te Ahupo. Te Hupo. Oh, do you big man ass? Here comes Molly Pickle. Big swing. Front side hook. Your 2022 world champion in the orange jersey, give it up for seven time world champion Stephanie Gilmore. And your number one seed, reigning back to back champion in the Hydro Flask leader jersey, Carissa Moore. Stephanie Gilmore has just taken the first match over Carissa Moore in the best of three series to have the advantage going into title match number two. You're watching the biggest day in pro surfing here at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Time for title match, heat number two with two incredible rivals, two incredible world champions. Stephanie Gilmore favored with one win. She got one more win. She'll break the record she carries with Lane Beachley and create history. If Carissa can get back in this, it will force a third match to decide the world title in 2022. Stage is set. Joe Turpel alongside maybe one of my favorite rivalries in the game. I'm still blown away. You guys can sit next to each other with all you've been through in the water. Now total respect. Three-time world champ Mick Fanning, 11-time world champ Kelly Slater here for the call, crowning our world champions. First of all, Mick, so incredible to see you once again on such an incredible day for pro surfing. Yeah, good to see you too, Joe. Yeah, what, what a day. Um, you know, it's it, I just love what goes on to the, with this final day and, uh, yeah, just the pressure share the build up everyone knows when it's going to happen and uh, to get it first day of the waiting period um, get it done let's go Kelly I love your analytical mind thinking about this day for a long time and you're giving value to all the final five coming into the day how have you seen it played out and lead us up to what you're seeing right now super interesting morning with uh, Steph Mick and I were just talking about that before how I know for myself, I don't know about for Mick, but I know for myself, I, I usually, at the contests I do well in, contests that I've won, I usually have some heat that really tests me. And it makes me either like get in the zone or just step out of the contest. And Steph had that first up this morning. She was behind the eight ball. She kept falling on waves, picking the wrong waves. And then all of a sudden it just clicked in. And, and then you saw in her second, third heat, she started surfing much better. Third heat especially, she got a quick start. And... Um, I think Steph at this size of lowers is super hard to beat and you saw she already she's she's unbeaten today and uh, she's already got Chris on the back foot after one round um, on the men's side of things uh, a little bit sleepy like I I, I wanted to see a, obviously a little bit more opportunity for Ethan um, but Kanoa I knew I knew Kanoa was a good chance out here um, Italo, I think he looks better this year than he's ever looked at lowers to me. I, in some of the edits I've seen, he looks a lot crisper and more complete and put together on his waves. And uh, <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, like I said, Ethan, it, it didn't come together for him. Jack, it looked to me like Jack was really out of his element in a way. Like, he, he usually looks so composed, he makes the right choices, and he rarely makes a mistake. And it looks like once he got behind a little bit in that heat, he looked like he had to surf outside of himself, and uh, and he just kind of fell apart because those waves he got 
weren't that great of waves, and he's trying to make more happen on them because he knew he was going to have to step that up to Ethelo. So interesting looking at the day to see where we're at now, and for Mick, for what Steph is going through. I mean, you know what it's like to ask about more world titles and what will that mean and what will that mean. She handles that all day long, but this eighth kind of feels different and almost worthy of that question when it's so close to a record-breaking moment. Yeah, it's it's a massive moment. Um, you know, the next sort of 35 minutes, uh, I guess you've got to sit there and in her situation, you don't want to let the moment get too far ahead. Um, like as Kelly said this morning, she had a couple of falls, and I think that put a, a B right in a bonnet and just really fired her up. And sort of looks like she just got rid of the nerves. Um, and and I think she's just surfing on instinct now, which is a dangerous mm. Stephanie Gilmore for anyone. Uh, you know, Carissa. But also proactive. Yes. Like she started out. And she fought for a position in that first heat, and she got the one good wave that really came in that in that 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Yeah, I, I think you know this rivalry too. Like Steph's probably looking at Chris going, look, if you want that sixth, you've got to take it. Uh, so it's it's pretty, it's really exciting. Um, Carissa, she lost the first one last year and came back to win two to to go on mm -hmm. to win. Um, so. Look, it's, it's anyone's game still. Uh, conditions are forever changing out here, so uh, it's, it's going to be exciting. I mean, these are the heats that you're always hoping for. As surf fans, uh, for surfers on tour, you want to see the world champs, the most decorated surfers, be in the water to decide a world title. But speaking from world champs' perspective, how hard is it to kind of stay on and not get carried away in the moment, Kelly? I mean, for a situation like this, for Steph and Carissa, they know there's a lot on the line. They do, and uh, what I'm noticing right now, just looking back before, is that um, Steph has kind of given, uh, she's giving up position a little bit, but she, she, didn't, she didn't give up position in the first heat. I, I, I would personally like to see her just be like really aggressive to start this heat out and get herself in that position to, to uh, she probably needs to rattle Carissa a little bit, because Carissa's surf level is just unbelievable, always. And um, on an open face wave like here or like Bells, when she just has that room to move, she's so good and so powerful. So fun to watch. 30 minutes to go here. Toledo just took title match number one as he leads over Italo. He's hanging out with Luisa. It's all good. We're here. <laughs> Filipino, walk us through this match. Um, yeah, fun one, you know. Uh, being number one, it's, you know, it's a good advantage. I was just sitting home watching and cruising and having fun with my kids and family, uh, preparing myself, preparing my mind, and, you know, finally got to surf my first heat. Felt really good. My board's really, really good. Uh, I felt like my second wave could have been a little higher, uh, like 817, you know, or flat eight. Um, the wave was really hard to surf, and I surfed that at my best, I feel. And, um, yeah, I just feel great. Uh, super confident, happy, and uh, let's go get this title. Let's go get it. Thank you. Thank you, Luisa. Still a happy voice from Felipe, fresh off the win. Much different look into the headspace of Italo. Remember, surfing from match one, losing on a close decision. A couple of judges had him winning that first, first match. So he's trying to just take a quick moment to prepare for a must-win situation. Hmm. That's coming up next. Toledo looking very happy-go-lucky. I mean, I, first thing I think about is some of the heartbreak moments that he's had. Mick, you've been involved in a title race with Felipe, even thinking of 2015. How much have you seen him change and grow into the world title contender he is today from that moment? Yeah, I think in those early days, I don't think he really believed that he was a, worthy of a world title. Like, he would get to number one and then everyone go to pipe and, you know, all the talk across social media across all the websites was he's not ready he can't serve pipeline and um, I think sometimes he just believed that and didn't really go and apply himself that well where now it's a totally different story he's gone and proved himself in all different kinds of conditions um, but you know this is essentially his backyard uh, he comes down here and surfs you know, on days like this all the time so I, I'm sure he's feeling comfortable sleeping in his own bed um, yeah I, I think I think he feels ready I think I think getting so close last year, um, yeah, that definitely fueled the fire for this year. And, uh, you know, people talk about if Gabe and John were still in it, would it still be the same? But I feel like the surf he's been doing it has been incredible. He's been so consistent this year. It's been an impressive season for Felipe as he'll come up next. Still waiting for the first wave to happen in heat number two for Carissa and Steph Gilmore as we'll check in with Strider. Hey. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I got a question for you, Joey. Uh, 
Rip Curl WSL Finals. Best two out of three, Kelly Slater versus Mick Fanning. Who's going to win? Oh, sure. hey, hey, they, they can hear me. I usually get to talk about that stuff when they're in the water. Uh, Come to, on, let's hear it. Uh, to be honest, I think of so many crazy memories with these two oh, at lowers. I, 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 honestly, I think, I, I think we're almost exactly tied. You might be a one, one heat against uh, ahead of me in the overall head-to-head. -head. I think yeah. in my last year, I might have got you one. Yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> I think, okay, like, man, I think you have like 15 and I have 14. I think he got me. I think that makes sense that we have that Heritage Series moment unfold at lowers sometime soon. Yeah. I, well, if the wind was better, we should have it today. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we had it I, yesterday. Wait, yeah. wait, now, you know, we've got some water under the bridge. You know, there was, a, remember, a couple of events here at lowers where I feel like you guys had to give each other some space. Uh, can you guys speak to that? Was there any truth to those moments back when you both were competing for the same thing? Yeah, there was definitely times where it was intense. Um, you know, I think... We almost got in a fight. Well, yeah. That Finally. night. It was true. We did. We, did. We, had to, we had to hug it out the next day on the phone. And just, you know, and it, but it was good. It, I, I, you know, the, the one thing I've always loved and respected about Mick is he's a, he's a straight-up guy. He, there's no black and – it's all black and white. There's no, like, gray area. You know, Mick tells you how he feels, and he's, he's direct. And we, we've just always been able to leave it in the water. And I feel like it's allowed me, uh, you know, to, to compete more freely against Mick because I know that I can just do my thing in the water, and we get out, and it's all good, you know. But uh, I've always respected that about Mick, and I think it's drawn out the best in my surfing when we've had heats. Oh, 100% on my side, too. It's, um, you know, I always sort of going up against the go. You, you want to just go and just surf uh, and test yourself. And, um, yeah, this one moment, we had this weird sort of paddle situation. I was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I was so angry. Yeah. And um, But, yeah, look, it, it, I think that's how, you know, we just wanted to go and surf, and we just wanted to let the surfing do the talking. And um, well, yeah. it, it, truth be told, there was more. There's a lot more to it, but most people don't know the story about Darren Hanley and Stephen Bell. Oh yeah, that's and a that's bet. Side that's bets. what our heats are. <laughs> our heats are all about a $500 side bet on every single heat we've ever had between those two. Are you serious? Uh huh. This and, whole time. And, and so Mick and I aren't really worried about our points and score. We are trying to win our guy 500 bucks so we got a nice dinner there we go. <laughs> that's amazing we're enjoying our time here but kaipo is always in the best seat in the house i think turtle bay is hosting him out right now that's right joe i'm in the, the turtle bay vip deck right now and it's hard to get access in here but this is the best view with the best people right here and i got access into the vip we're all enjoying finals day joe what a spot kaipo Got Griffin there, Crosby, the Cola Pinto family, and all the local kids that snuck in there and got wristbands. That's hard to do. Way to go. Don't blow their cover, man. Yeah, <laughs> they're allowed to do whatever let they them, want Let today. them live. Yeah. Let them live, Joe. Let them enjoy their time. As we have maybe a potential start, down to 24 on the clock. Uh, Mick, speak to the crowd here and the venue. You know, we compare a lot of different energies that you feel on tour. What about lower trestles what makes it makes it special to compete here um yeah look it's you you're right there you feel it uh kind of like snapper yeah close up yeah but also too when you're running past like i remember like being in events with kelly you knew when he was surfing because all of a sudden you couldn't even get to the competitors area <laughs> it was just totally packed but the crowd really get into it and uh such a diverse crowd here like especially when tide gets low and you can see it out in the rocks they get right into it and um it's awesome it, you you feel the energy it's 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 amazing so get loud out there and you feed off it i know kelly i've seen you win out here in so many different waves mastering this lineup we have a very unique swell direction and mm. weather pattern for today yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, are you have the same lineup markers? Is it really reliable lowers right now to pick your marks? I think it has been all day, but I was just noting as we sat down in the booth here, the swell looks like it's turned a bit more south, or there was at least a set maybe from that hurricane that, that was really south, and it just kind of closed out the whole right, closed out straight away. And here we go. Steph up to get it going. And... Uh, chasing this one down a little bit now she's right in the flow of the wave and here she goes a nice big hook and that's what she she really needs to get out away from the lip and get that uh, that point of difference in her surfing because she got stuck there a little bit earlier and uh, talk to this the one, next there, one. oh you guys commentate <laughs> <laughs> chris is going to throw down a turn right in front of steph jams it sprays her a little bit there on that last one 
That used to be so important when I was young. Spray the other person. Oh, you know, feels gotta, good. Gotta it's classic <laughs> and important, especially when you're in a world title match. Chris in a must-win situation as she will jam the end section complete there. She got the better of it, but I don't think he, either of those were very consequential. But they've sat for now 12, 13 minutes, and it, it seems like we've got this lull, we've got this chop, a little bit of bump out in the water. The wind's going to only pick up throughout the day with this weather pattern we have. And um, so who knows, that, that might come into play, but I don't think there was a lot, there wasn't a lot of sort of a ton in either of those rides. Um, there Maybe just a bit of a nerve settler there for Carissa. Yeah. Steph's, you know, Steph's chasing this one down. As she's in front, she just wants to go and, uh, you know, put the nail in the coffin early. But, you know, Steph looks really on point here. That car was really nice. Uh, just unfortunate that it sort of closed out. But I felt like this is a way that for, for Carissa, she didn't really nail one in that first heat. So it's probably a good nerve settler mm. for her. Yeah, good point. I feel like this wave looked like it was going to run off on her, on her, but it didn't give her, see how it's like, there's not a lot of energy pushing back on her there. She's kind of manufacturing and then it went into the foam from uh, Steph's wave, but I think uh, she's smart enough to know she went past Steph. There has been some lulls. She might as well maximize this ride. She's not going to get priority anyway, so she'll maximize that ride and get back out and, uh, and maybe just concentrate on that being the backup score, but both of them, both of them, uh, They've sort of put their stake in the ground, but it, it, there's not much to it yet. Chris and Moore hoping for a sixth world title today. Stephanie Gilmore hoping to break the record that she shares with Lane Beachley. She does it, that'll make it eight. She already has the record for most event wins in women's surfing history as she picked up another victory early this year in El Salvador. Chris and Moore, one big win in Brazil, but incredible consistency from pipeline all the way through to Tahiti. And it's sort of interesting how your legacy builds. You know, both of you multiple-time world champions. Everyone always asking what's your new motivation. And for Carissa, what's really been highlighting for me is this ultimate consistency she's had well, going for three in a row. She's never done that in her career. Mm. Could happen in 2022, Mick. What does that change for her legacy and what she means to surfing history if she can add another one today? Yeah, there's not many people that have gone on and won three in a row. I think there's uh, what, maybe three or four on the women's side. Um, there's only two on on the on the men's side. Andy and MR, and I think, yeah, three yeah. of us maybe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Look, it, it's 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 a huge legacy. It's um, and I think each time you go into a new year, you've got to look for some sort of new motivation. You've got it might be the tiniest little thing, um, but you, you keep doing the same thing over and over again. Sometimes you're like, oh, I've already gotten that. I've got that same feeling. So you got to mm. add some new spark to that. Yeah, her uh, psych coach, Chris, the psych coach, uh, he surfs Rockies all the time, and he was actually saying it was the first time she felt after Olympic gold, fifth world title, all the energy into this event for the first time. She actually woke up the next day going, whoa, where do I go from here? It had the best year of her life, and it took her a while to redefine her motivation, and look where she's sitting now, wearing the Hydro Flask leader's jersey. Her first score is in, Kelly, 5-1-7. Just under Steph started a 583. How'd you like mm. the comparison there? Well, it's interesting because obviously Steph's was a lot shorter. I thought, <clears throat> just based on number of maneuvers and length of ride, I guess Carissa was going to get the better of it. But Steph did that really big arc. She chased it down, had a lot of speed, and timed it real well on that carve. And that's going to give her a lot of confidence here. See it, that first wave of set real choppy. You got to time those so perfectly like Felipe was doing in that last heat, you really have to be so precise or you gotta wait for that second wave. You can see that that one has a cleaner face. So Steph Gilmore trying to combo it up to get her second scoring ride. I think sometimes she's fallen into like a Parco comparison of everyone saying she makes it look so easy, but mm. we're kind of hearing more and more actually how much she does apply herself to being at a high fitness level at all times. It's just her nature that she makes things look so good. Yeah, when you're naturally talented, you know, that used to be the rumors around uh, Kelly too, like doesn't train or whatever. Um, but yeah, she she's so naturally gifted, like naturally gifted that she you know, she didn't have to work that hard as a, as a young teenager. I heard that she was training really hard coming into this event, and then um, the the new thing that's happened is that she's got a new fin set up in her in her board, and that's given her a little bit more pushback into those carbs and that's why she's drawing out those carbs a little bit more so she's it's a, it's a new feel for her what she do bigger fan or 
we've just clustered the fins a little oh, bit. Oh, pulled together. them in. Yeah, no, she mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. and um, it was sort of a mistake. We were playing around with twin fins, and um, it felt really good. And Ethan started using them as well. Ethan's been riding them, and then Steph just got one for this event, and it's, mm. it's, she's been really liking it. And uh, yeah, a little bit more feedback coming back under the feet, and mm. I think that's she's. Looks like she's excited learning, relearning a new board. That's so cool. Such great insight. I mean, and that speaks to both of you, but it's never like, okay, this worked last year. I'll do that again. It's like you're constantly searching for a slight edge that could be the difference in the following season. There are there are those boards that you know you put on ice and you go, I'm going back to that at J Bay. I'm going back to that at Bells. I'm going back to that at Pipe. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I mean, look, I've probably thrown away many dozens of heats riding ulterior equipment and setups just for looking for a new feel looking for something more interesting and fun for me um and and you know to mix point like when you've done something it's hard to want it as much the next time so you look for some new thing and uh, obviously uh both of these girls have something on the line here um carissa looking for her sixth and steph trying to stop that and and, and pass lane and uh, so you, you know that Carissa's husband and Lane are watching this heat, definitely pulling for, for Carissa. As <laughs> <laughs> well, like you think about it, like Steph can go on to win eight and be, be the all-time greatest of all time, or Carissa goes and wins six, and now she's right there on right the cusp. there on the cusp for joining yeah. them for seven. It, it's it's such a learning and such a big situation right now for the women. The yeah. craziest part about it, we've got 16 minutes to find out if Steph could clinch that eighth world title right now in the water and lower trestles. Carissa does have priority and she needs a 3.84 to push it to a third and deciding title match. We'll see if she can do it right after this. WSL. We travel all over the world, chasing the best waves and surfing the nicest beaches. But we don't just surf. We're also doing our best to protect the thing we love most by restoring coasts, stopping plastic pollution, and reducing climate impacts. We know we're not the only ones trying to save the ocean, so we want to hear what you're up to. Use hashtag WeAreOneOcean and tag WSL to share your sustainability story still feeling like I'm a whole person without needing to win is, is a really important human experience. Especially because you've had an unusual amount of winning. Imagine if your life was a movie, what would you do? After all this time, I almost want people to experience it, this story that I've had. To properly meditate, it should probably be like, oh. Um... Let's flash back on the start of the year for Stephanie Gilmore. Started off in a tough way, uh, unable to compete in pipe for COVID protocol. So she started off a bit late at sunset, was upset incredibly early, picked up the pace in Portugal, got to a semi-final finish. But at this point, we're going, is Steph going to requalify? I mean, the mid-season cut was new, had to perform at Bells and Margaret River, and she got to show up in G-Land. Great to see her out there where she got a quarterfinal finish for showing at El Salvador and took the major victory, which always makes sense. Set point breaks anywhere around the world and was able to get another great semifinal at Jeffries Bay, where she is always one of the greats to watch. Poetry in motion on right-hand point breaks. Went to the end of the road, got there nice and early, ended up with an equal fifth before leading into the Rip Crow WSL Finals. Back into live action. Carissa Moore, vertical start, gets a bit out of rhythm on that first section. Incomplete, Steph with priority with 13 and a half to go. And there's a little set coming, looks like, <clears throat> and Carissa having just caught that one and that whitewash moving through, it might clean the face up. So we'll see if, there's a, it looks like there's a bump out the back here with a good wedge, it's hitting the right part. I feel like this heat's been, well, I know this heat's been pretty sleepy and I feel like both of them have not found their footing yet. And, you know, somebody needs to take that position. We'll see if Steph can do it right here. Rolling in now, Steph Gilmore looking to better a 3 one seven as she'll swing off the top. Tight jam there. Wasn't expecting that type of move. Wraps it again. Plenty of wall to work with. She'll jam it off the lip. Nice transition into the forehand hook. 
Lays nice. into that with some style. 317's gone. Jams it, stays on her feet, showing no signs of fatigue, Nick. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I think we saw last year with the waves coming in, people were fatiguing. This year, it seems like people have started from the first heat all the way through, but we're not seeing fatigue. And um, I think that was always a, a factor that we thought would happen with Steph, but she looks on point. Whatever she's done in the lead up to this mm. is, um, yeah, best she's performed on a big five. She looks Day. She looks great, and I think I think the difference for me is those small turns, where she's turning them into almost like a major turn, like she's she's setting up. You can see later in on this wave, we'll we'll talk through it here. I almost thought this wave messed her up right here because it broke a little, and she was going for the carve, and it kind of bottomed out underneath her. And then here she timed that really well to get up there. See how there's a little down spot there. She got up there quick, timed that good, got a little tail release, and here drew that all the way around for a little variety. And then right here, boom, back on the back foot, little Mick Fanning influence right there, and uh, finishes it off. I think I, I can, I, you know, you surf so many of these heats, you start to have a feeling for what they feel when they're riding. And I feel like in that wave, she realized this could be my world title wave right here. There's not that great waves. Some one of us needs to make a stand right here. And um, that was a really well written wave. It didn't it didn't look like it was going to be that great of a wave. And she turned it into a lot of a lot of good stuff. Stephanie Gilmore drops an eight as she's hoping for an eighth world title. Strider, will it happen in the next 11 minutes? I, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. The way that she rode that wave was simply unbelievable. She was turning into sections. And, and I, I guess it's the new fin cluster that Mick was talking about, but she's compressing so perfectly into those corners, and she looks new and, and fresh and alive, and she has been, you know, training for this moment. We've been surfing up north every day, and she's just been so laser-focused. But to watch her surf this well under pressure is so fun to watch. I'm going to ask you guys in the booth. you got two goats in there of surfing. you got a goat of uh, commentating. you got two goats in the water here. What is it that make, that separates you guys from the rest of the field. I mean, it's just so unbelievable to watch the separation of how well these guys compete and how well you guys have done it. There's got to be a little element, a little something that you guys have extra. I think the big thing in these sort of situations is that there's nothing to lose. She, you know, you're either losing to a seven-time world champion or you're losing or a five to a five-time world yeah, champion. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's not like, oh, is it a wild card or is it that? So that is nerves of like, am I disappointed of who I lost to is there. So you just leave it all out there. And we'll see if this will be the set that gets Carissa back in there. This first one looks like, does it have much wall to it, Mick? No, no. Can't really, really tell. No. And these first waves of the set, you see how bumpy they are on the face, and it's really hard to find a good arc and angle. You know, you're looking at the geometry and the curve of this face. And you can see down line, it's not going to piece together and, and, and turn back at you. That wave just kind of fizzled out into the channel. And again, it just feels like Steph is going from strength to strength and just building on, on what she has. And, um, you know, to mix point, uh, what Strider was saying is like, there's, at, at this point for both of these women, there's no, there's no, of course, the, the world title's right in your hand, you could lose it, but it's, uh, there's no hard feelings losing against somebody that's as good as either of them. And so they just leave it out. I don't, th I don't think there's any nerves. I think it's just lay it all out there on every wave that you ride. And I always felt, uh, like I was mentioning about Mick before, I always felt more comfortable serving as a Mick Fanning or a Joel Parco or uh, a John John because I just know that there's no there's no level below where I can go that I that I can surf at to beat them. I got to surf up at my top level, and so I'm not distracted by like, oh, well, could I surf at 70 percent or can yeah. I take it a little easy? I got to like lay the whole thing out there. I got to push the rail each time. And what Strider was asking about is these moments, these situations, this life that we have in this competition allows us each to ourselves to push ourselves a little bit more in each turn, each wave, and. And uh, again, she's each person we surf against. Really special, Mick. I'm sure you, you can relate to that. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you, you, it was almost like those first few rounds during during an event. It was almost nerve wracking. Yeah. And then once you got <laughs> to finals day, I was like, oh, I can breathe again. Quarter finals, I don't even have nerves anymore. But first first round or two, I can get nervous sometimes. But quarter finals, I'm like. Did my job, and I'm gonna have some fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you got the results, and so now it's time to uh, put the icing on the cake. Um, yeah. I was gonna just sort of sitting in this situation. Um, I don't know, sitting 
I was going to ask you, Kelly, every t any time that you've actually sat behind and you needed a heat win to go on to win the world title, mm. did you feel like that pressure would build up, like in Carissa's sense now, and you sort of start making, you're trying to force it a little bit? For sure. There, there have been, even in those years that I've had, like, I had an amazing year in 08, and I think I won three of the first four events, and I was like, oh my gosh, I could lock this thing up pretty easily, pretty early this year. Like maybe we my that too. best year ever. <laughs> and, 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 and then it slapped me right back into shape in Bali that year. <laughs> As we'll continue that story in a second, Boom. Gilmore, beautiful first turn, wraps it on the second effort, trying to build on a 5.83, lays into a stylish frontsider carve. Throws down another rail hook, those in-between turns, like you mentioned, looking incredible as she'll finish on her feet. And that was just pure desire and strength to make that last ride. She knows that that could be enough, that single ride. Six and a half minutes left. Basically, Carissa's almost almost combo, not quite combo, but needs a big eight. She needs but to move now to salvage her season. Wearing the Hydro Flask leader's jersey, she doesn't want to go down in this second heat. Beautiful frontside carve. Carissa needs more on this inside section. Lays into it. Keeps her board above the water to ride out. 177's seven, gone. But you mm. still see Gilmore favored heading into the back end of this heat, Mick. Yeah, I think Steph better than 583, but that was definitely Carissa's best wave. I mm. feel like, uh, you know, she's fighting now. She's got to really dig in and, um, you know, try and rip the feet out of uh, the, the, the jaws of defeat, really. Um, I guess, yeah, it's now or never. It's like the whole season comes down to this. doesn't matter what's happened before that, but it's going to be interesting to see where these scores sit to see how we're going to finish these last five minutes. Kelly, what would you see here? Great first arc, kind of arc with a setup. Times the second one pretty good. Kind of chasing it down here. The wave's starting to get into that foam, but that was a really nice carve. Held that edge all the way back around. And then right here, had to stick this. You know, she almost got her weight a little back in her heels and, 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 and could have potentially not finished that ride on her feet like Felipe did a couple times in his. You know, he fell on a couple of those end turns that could have really sealed that heat for him. But good start there. And, I mean, you, you really don't want to give Carissa an inch, you know, if you're, if you're Steph. Because if, if Carissa wins this heat, that takes a lot of wind out of the sails. So let's watch Steph here. Boom, big first turn. Really well timed. Her wave wasn't as clean. You see how she, she had to kind of time that a little bit differently there. She kind of steps on the back foot. I thought she was going to get stuck there. She did a touch. And then here, boom, nice little hack in the pocket. And this one, she needed to finish out. That was easy to fall right there. The fins kind of released, and she was like on her heels. And um, gosh, I don't know. Those are pretty similar rides. I think, I, I, I do think, I do think Steph might have just bettered it with the sort of faster end part. Um, I don't, we'll see what the judges think, but they're pretty comparable rides. If Steph gets the better score here, Carissa needs the best ride of the heat to win. First sign of a score for Gilmore now. One more to drop. She's definitely improving her position in the lineup. Had the eight early, but the 5.83 is clearly gone. In a very important exchange, maybe the most important of 2022. And judges still thinking about the replay from Carissa Moore, very close decision. Gilmore just looking for one more win to clinch an eighth title. Now it's a 6.67 for Steph Gilmore. Carissa now needs a 9.5 before her waves factored in. But in that similar range like you expected, Kelly. And yeah. it comes in at a 6.8, <laughs> basically matching each other. Carissa with priority needs a 7.88 to keep her season alive. When you're in a heat and you get a really good score like Steph had with the eight earlier, if you can have your second score better than their high score, you just feel like you're in the driver's seat. You just feel like you just gained so much on them. And if your second if your second score is better than their best score, the pressure just goes immediately on the other surfer. And uh, we got three and a half minutes left. She only needs a seven, eight. I mean, she can, she can easily do that. Carissa is definitely not out of this heat, but, um, and, and she has priority. That's big. Mick, you're just kind of putting it on Kelly about thinking about your year and what it all comes down to when every heat's a must-win situation. What about when it comes down to three minutes and you've been in the driver's seat of the year, you in the Hydro Flask leader's jersey, and you have three minutes to try to save your entire season? 
you just have to hope there's a wave. And then, um, you know, that's what you train for. That's why you have all those practice heats. That's why you've had all these heats since you've been a 12-year-old kid. Oh, you've she missed it. She missed it. And the one behind's a bigger wave. Carissa Moore loses priority. Oh, my gosh. 245 to go. Oh my gosh, this is, this is a, that's a heartbreaker for Carissa because this could be a real clean wave and I think Steph's going to have to go. I think she's, it, it would be the smart thing. See how clean this wave is now? This is the first time she's had the second wave of the set in this heat and it's probably the cleanest face. It's got a long wall stretching out ahead of her. With this low tide, these waves kind of, what? Grab draw reverse for Steph Gilmore, free to go for it after Carissa missed that wave, lost priority. And now we have 2.10 on the clock to see if we're witnessing a record-breaking moment in surfing history. It's been a story of momentum for Steph today. She's just been, she, it's that thing with that first heat. She's just been gliding on that wind in the sail since heat one. A little bit of a hiccup, a little scary moment against Brissa, and then, and then, you know, it's just been all, that right all going there. her way right there. What did you see there, Mick? That was a huge moment. That was just indecision, I think. I think that was uh, pressure. And, uh, you know, in this situation with Steph, she, she just go for it. Um, you know, she she just had to keep Carissa off that wave. Who knows if another wave's going to come in a minute and a half, but you just go and just try and better your last it's score. It's a big moment right there, I think, in women's pro surfing, because she, uh, Carissa, Two years ago in, in uh, Australia, did the air reverse, and it was just sort of revolutionary on the tour for that to start to come into play for the women in their heats. And then Steph throws a big turn, a finishing turn. I didn't expect that. I thought she was going to keep racing because I looked back and saw the wall in that wave. Um, and instead, she just threw it around. But I, I still, I, I still don't c count Carissa out because I know Carissa on the right wave out here can get a 9.5 or whatever she's going to need if, if uh, Steph betters what she just had. Into the final minutes, Stephanie Gilmore has changed surfing history so many times in her career, winning as a rookie in 2007. Now at 34 years of age, a shot to break the tie that she carries with Lane Beachley. And we have 35 seconds left. Gilmore's last 7.23. Carissa with priority needs an 8.43 as we stare out to the horizon. Not too much at the moment, Mick. There's nothing coming. And that's that's gonna be all she wrote. Steph's getting her eighth. That's that amazing. Is wild. That's incredible. She had to surf all the way from the first first heat this morning. And to see a battle of the biggest names on paper on tour that have changed the game of pro surfing to share the water together at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. It was a long shot for Steph Gilmore, but let's close <laughs> this one out. One of the most emotional and deserving moments of Stephanie Gilmore's career. She holds the record to herself, officially an eight-time world champion. Oh, I'm so proud of her. That's so great. Um, she had such a tough year way to start the start the year. I know it's gonna be a really tough pill for Chris to swallow. But um, Steph started the year with that COVID situation. You know, 12 hours later, if they ran her heat, she could have surfed because she was in her three or five day waiting period to get over COVID. And uh, they only got like two heats out of the way that day. It didn't help finish the contest earlier. So it was a real bummer for Steph. And um, you know, good on good on Carissa for going over and, and lending that support and a hug because it's got to be real tough for her to deal with and process her emotions right now. What an unbelievable moment in pro surfing history. Strider already with the eight time world champion. I'm going to give you a moment. You're going to have to let this one soak in a little bit. Unbelievable. You let me know when you're ready, okay? Fuck yeah! I think she's ready! <laughs> Rip Curl, WSL final champion and eight world titles. Stephanie Gilmore, you are a weapon. Let me hear your thoughts. I don't have much left, to be honest. <laughs> oh my God, I just, I visualized it so much. And I was like, let's do this. Like, I have a chance. Let's just prove this whole system wrong, you know? Like, if you can come from the bottom, come from fifth and win a world title. That's freaking cool. But I really like Carissa as the world champ to me this year. She, she's had the best season ever. So I'm so honored to surf against her in this final. And oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm so dead. <laughs> Congratulations, young lady. You just defied all odds and brought it home. 
record-breaking eighth world title. Give me five. Give me some love. Yeah! We're going to send her in, you guys. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks for all the support. It's been a wild day. Let's get one in. Here we go. Stephanie Gilmore breaks the record and is officially the greatest. Most event wins, most world titles, now with eight as she was the long shot starting at the bottom at the first match and now an eight-time world champion. Wearing the orange jersey, it's seven-time world champion Stephanie Gilmore! Wild to think of Steph having not even made a final yet, let alone a win this year. Is she going to be in the WSL Final Five, or is Steph kind of just gone for this year? I'm born to win. That's classic Steph right there. You know her as La Reina, we know her as the Queen. I love it, I love doing it. Here comes Steph Gilmore. I'm born to win. Right stop from Gilmore. Turks and fellow women's champion. Stephanie Gilmore, your champion of the Rip Curl WSL Finals and 2022 World Champion. I'm Eric Abel. I'm the artist for this year's Rip Curl WSL Finals in Trestles. Being a surf artist and, and getting to do the artwork for the Rip Curl WSL Finals at Trestles, the biggest day in surfing of the year. I mean, what more could you ask for? So it was pretty cool designing the jerseys for this event. Each jersey represents kind of a different aspect of Trestles. We got the blue one, it's got perfect wave on it. You got the green one, you got the flora coming down, walking down trestles, the iconic trestles cobblestones for orange. And the pink one, you got the pelican. And the number one jersey, got the nice yellow sunshine going. So it was just a really cool element in this project to design the jerseys for the top five. I'm gonna be doing some sort of artwork down there. It's gonna be epic, the surf, I'm sure it's gonna be pumping. Everybody's gonna be going off. There is no way to talk about world champions without bringing up Kelly Slater, the kid from Cocoa Beach, Florida, who defeated generations of the world's best surfers, holding an unmatched 11 world titles and runaway records for event wins, heat wins, and just about any other stat you could count. Kelly defies logic, age, and entropy. But Slater's greatest gift isn't just his sheer dominance. He's still in there. Oh, oh, yes. oh, my God. As the sport's first true crossover star, he made his name synonymous with surfing writ large, inspiring waves of new challengers and unlocking a new stratosphere of success for every kid with a surfboard and a dream. The new crop of surfing's brightest stars will face off at the 2022 Rip Curl WSL Finals. Ladies and gentlemen, the title matches are on! Surfing all the way from match one, your 2019 world champion in the green jersey, Spring-loaded, tail-high, full oh, rotation punt. And your current number one seed wearing the yellow Hydro Flask Leaders jersey, number 77, Felipe Toledo! Felipe now needs one more win to become a world champion, heading into the second title match. As the celebration continues for a historical moment in pro surfing history, Stephanie Gilmore just getting her eighth world title as she holds that record to herself. We have one more title to decide today. Toledo versus Ferreira, an all-Brazilian clash. Italo looking for a second world title and Felipe looking for his first. The Brazilian dynasty continues in pro surfing. 
Toledo won the first match, so he's in a great position. Italo can't afford to lose. Joe Trapel against a couple of the all-time greats here, Mick Fan and Kelly Slater. Here for the call, domination at lowers, and obviously in big world title moments as well. Starting with Felipe Mick, he's looking like everything's working to his plan, looking calm and comfortable as he controlled that first win to kick off the day. Yeah, it sort of felt like a little bit of flowing on from last year for him. Um, we always know Philippe's so deadly out here at Lowers and in any sort of uh, way from two to six foot, he's just so electric and, and fiery. And I think he wanted to get out and get a quick start. Um, but yeah, Italo as well. He's so electric, man. Uh, this, it's two titans going at it. When you look at the waves right now, who do you think is favored, Kelly? And what are, what are the options they have for what they're capable of? If the wind didn't kick up as much, I would have it real steady, even battle. Uh, because those lefts would be clean, you could piece them together. But I give, a, I give the edge to Felipe because he's just so precise with that timing. And on the forehand, you're more down the line, keeping the momentum going. And I also feel like the board uh, the way that Italo's board looks to me, it looks a little bit like he's on the tail, like a lot of rocker. And it's a, it's a shorter arc turn that he seems to be doing. And out here, you need that drivey long turn. And, and uh, Felipe's got that four fin that just looks like it's flying like a carpet. And uh, I, I definitely give the edge to him. O on top of the fact that he is the fastest, best guy out here. He's got the most variety. And if he needs to go on a left on his backhand, he's got that. But uh, you know, if somebody can reel him in, it's Italo. So interesting at the start of these heats, Italo versus Felipe. How do they tend to play this game before the first wave is gone? Yeah, look, there was a heat this morning. Italo was very aggressive with Kanoa. Um, and, you know, I feel like Philippe isn't that aggressive when it comes to that very first wave. He sort of wants to just get surfing and get moving. Um, so, yeah, as you can see there, Italo's got the inside. But, uh, yeah, he'll probably fight. A little bit harder to, to get that very first good wave. Oftentimes, Mickey'd say, Hey, Don, I don't even want to worry about that. Just go ahead and hassle all that you want, and I'll just sit here until you get started. I mean, can they can it, they apply that today, or is the first wave too important? I think it all just depends. Like, you don't have to, you know, paddle to uppers to get the actual very first wave, but, you know, even just sitting next to someone and and putting that pressure on them as we see the, the queen. <laughs> Number eight. Uh, what a special moment. Uh, I think we got pretty emotional here in the booth. Uh, and, uh, we certainly <laughs> did. It was just a season, like you both were mentioning, that was so improbable. You know, missing pipe. Uh, but, you know, having to think about qualification for the back end, let alone getting the eighth world title this year, and then being the bottom seed, you know, kicking off in the first match. She had a lot ahead of her today and was comboed by Brisa at the halfway mark of match number one. Uh, what a feeling for Steph Gilmore. Uh, maybe the most emotional moment I've, I've witnessed from her in a long time. Yeah, uh, you know, champions rise. <laughs> and she's risen and risen again. And uh, now she's in a whole new stratosphere all by herself. Big shout out to Lane Beachley as well, who uh, shared that title uh, with Steph for, for many years, uh, getting seven a long time ago. In fact, Lane went six in a row, which is uh, still a record that stands today. Uh, women's surfing is pushing through the, the limits as we thought we were going to have a, kind of a rookie change of the guard this year with the champions at the end. Ended up on top. <laughs> We're going to say it probably for the rest of the afternoon and for a while now. That was that was definitely, as we said, and it's cliche, but it's fitting. Yeah. That was history in the making. And it's perfect. The energy that Steph's feeling right now after a big accomplishment. We'll have more time to spend with her in a moment, but we're finally getting title match. He number two started, Felipe Toledo. Clean front side arc. Deep off the bottom, there's the vert. Using that open face well. Tracking through another roundhouse cutback. So clean he's keeping the rail on all of these turns. Whoa, what a flare at the end, but he didn't, oh. didn't make it again. That'd be a great little uh, clip right there, just in slow-mo of them both doing something big and falling. It looks like uh, Felipe just cut his hand or something. What's going on here? Cut his hand or lost his watch. Oh, maybe, maybe the watch, yeah. Oh, thankfully. Yeah, um, yeah, what a moment. Really cool to see. Somebody's cutting onions in here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's really got a heat wave uh, in Southern California for a long time. And 
It's definitely hot here on the set, hot in the water as we go back to Italo's wave here. Mick, what'd you see? Uh, yeah, look, he just aimed for that ramp and went for it and just, oh, I don't know, just caught that Over rotated yeah. almost, yeah. He also, a lot of times he corked him out so hard. Look how clean the rail was right there. That was a bumpy section. And then here it gets his tail up above it. And then here, look at how bumpy that wave is. There's no clean arc. And he'd made it, he'd forced his way through it. So he's just kind of dominating what these little waves are. And had he made that, he put a score up already, but they're gonna probably be a little bit harsh because it wasn't that big a wave. Mick, what's been your interpretation of Brazilian dominance, but not just by one individual, by kind of sharing the wealth of world titles from Medina getting three to De Souza to Italo, and now potentially Felipe adding it in almost rapid succession. You know, you throw John in the mix that broke it up a bit, but it's been unbelievable. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll look back in history um, and this group of Brazilian surfers that have come on to win world titles, I think we're going to look at it as, say, like Kelly's generation, the momentum generation that just came and just changed surfing. Um, it's it's incredible. I don't know what they've done. I don't know how they've done it. I think every other country in the world is trying to replicate that, but they're just, the guys are just so special. They're just, and they're so unique in their own ways. It's, uh, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. It's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> they're just so they're, these guys have such depth in their in their skill skill set and um no but they're all really good guys on uh, the, the, and they're they're really each individuals you know um gabriel adriano uh, uh italo felipe they're all very different types of people and uh, i enjoy i enjoy all of them they're really good guys and um i, I think it just comes out of a, a perfect storm of sheer desire and really being like sort of viewed as second-rate citizens in the surf world, like they're not winning the titles, they're not winning the contest, but they're on tour. And that happened for a couple generations. And all of a sudden, these guys said, no, it's not going to stick anymore. They, they took what Fabio and Flavio, Teco, and, um, and Neko all created, and they just took it a whole other step. They, they didn't sort of do one leapfrog. They jumped like a generation of skills. And these guys are the ones setting the standard. They're the ones that are, they're coming up with new airs and rotations and angles at waves and different ways to look at the waves, hanging out with skaters. Like th there's, a, there's a different mindset that's going on in these guys and th the amount of speed they have in a wave, the precision they have in their maneuvers and setting the rail and in touch with their equipment, like all of it. And learning different waves too. Italo came on, on tour and I just thought he was a little like small wave wizard. And then all of a sudden he started, he won at Pipeline. He figured out how to surf Tropo and Cloud Break. Um, and, and Medina goes without saying, he's been able to win everywhere. And, and, and in heats that you just thought he's down, he's not coming back and bang, bang, and just two waves and he's in the lead. And sometimes it's not the story if they've been there since they were 10. It was like they figured it out. They had the will to win and the confidence to compete and, and they were able to separate themselves from their heroes knowing that they had more fire in their belly to go all the way to win. Big thanks to Rip Curl, the big sponsor for the Rip Curl WSL Finals, reminding us all that you can recycle your wetsuit through their campaign. Rip Curl has partnered with the global recycling leader, TerraCycle, to offer environmentally conscious surfers the opportunity to recycle any surf-branded wetsuit and divert it from the landfill. Such a great cause to have it repurposed as I'm sure a lot of you locally have some old suits you can drop off at the Rip Curl store right here in San Clemente. Uh, what a great view of a very special lineup here at Lower Trestles. You can surf it just about every single day. And now hosting the World Titles Showdown for the second straight season. And it's been an important event in the past for Kelly and Mick for their World Title campaigns for many years. Italo, interestingly enough, he had a couple of reps out here uh, competing in the jersey, but he wasn't one of those guys that was running away with great mm. results in the past. Opposite story for Felipe, who had a very instant connection with the place. You got for it. No, I was, I was, I was, I would agree with that because I, like I said, I uh, earlier I was talking, talking to someone saying that I never felt like Italo was a standout here in terms of his surfing. He's such a standout in, in basically every crowd, and and it, at lowers he's never really like shook me. And I think that that's going to be a little bit of a tough thing if we if this final five keeps coming to trestles year after year, uh, if he can't maximize that left air or whatever. 
he, he's a little bit, uh, you know, I'm going to stop talking because Steph's there and ready, so we'll let her and we'll get back to this after. Oh, what an exciting moment. Rosie, take it away. Oh, this is amazing. Well, Steph, we were catching up, standing at Bells Beach. You were thinking about requalification. You've made the top five. You've won that eighth world title. What's going through your mind? This has been a challenging season. A lot of variables. Yeah, this has been a, a challenge for sure. It feels like the shortest season, but the longest year of my life. Um, you know, to start with such a shocker at, at Pipeline, to miss it and to have a bad one at Sunset and just kind of crawl my way back into the cart and it's, uh, it's just unbelievable, you know, and, and I was thinking out there, like, whatever happens, happens. I'm, I'm really proud that I was able to make it past Brisa, Tatiana, Joanne, all of the most incredible female surfers in the world. and and to be able to make it all the way to the final against Carissa, who in my mind, she's the real world champ this year. Like, she had such a stellar year. She had so many wonderful performances and I'm so inspired by what she does. And, and uh, yeah, you know, I was just out there thinking, hey, if this happens, this is freaking cool. But I wasn't bummed because I was out there against Carissa, and she really is the greatest of all time, in my opinion. Well, you guys have been so dominant in female surfing. So how special was that to be, you know, just stopping Carissa from clinching a six-world title and for yourself, that eighth-world title that's been so, just such a tangible goal for you? Yeah, it has been. You know, I really, I, I disliked this format, to be honest. I was like, this doesn't, the world champion should be crowned in, in all the different ways over the entire period of the year. And, and now I love it. <laughs> so, but, you know, that's the beauty of it. I've actually never, I don't think I've ever won a world title sitting in the water um, against the world number one. Like, that is... There really is not many words that can describe this feeling right now and and that's why I, I now love this format because it just it puts all the pressure on you, it puts you under the pump. Can you do it? It's it's truly incredible. So oh my god, I'm freaking out. This is insane. Like I can't believe it. Wow. Soak in this moment, okay. Steph, so well deserved. We're gonna send it back to you, Joey. Thanks so much, Rosie. Surfing history changed just moments ago as Stephanie Gilmore clinches her eighth world title and has a new love for the new format. Coming in at seed number five all the way to the title, getting past uh, some of the best in the world today, the best, all the way to her title. Back to action, aggressive start from Felipe Toledo. Quick whip in the pocket. Pushes so hard through those forehand carves. I felt like he released him to the world when he won Snapper back in 2015 in a similar size conditions on that finals day way back when, where he officially entered his first world title race in just his third season against the best of the world. That was startling, that event, when he beat Julian. And uh, Julian was on fire. And Felipe was on this other level. It's like, oh, man, we're in trouble. And I think there is always this talk of, like, oh, how good is he in the air? How good is he in the air? How fast is he? And then they're like, wait, how powerful is he with his turns? That really stood out to me way back in 2015, Mick. Yeah, like, even though he's a smaller frame, that speed that he carries and how much torque. Leverage. Yeah, yeah, just translate into power. And, uh, you know, I think he really came into his own when he that year in J-Bay where he did those two massive alley-oops, but then he was doing turns that people wouldn't fit in that area, and he was doing it so fast and coming out with such acceleration and uh, just putting so much torque into those. It was That was sort of his moment for coming out, and, like, yeah, he's a real threat. It was like a different... Uh, it was almost like uh, how Dane did when Dane first... When Dane came out, he started doing this crazy, like, just, you know, this, the thing he did at Hall Eva, mm -hmm. and then the way he surfed at J-Bay, you know, he was getting like nines at J-Bay on one turn because he would just throw the craziest thing into it and then somehow he'd make it. He'd be stuck behind, but it was so radical, no one else could do that. And um, it, it, he, Dane definitely looked at, at, at J-Bay in a different way, and it seems like Felipe took that to a different level even. And um, he's been so impressive in so many conditions. I, he and I surfed against each other in that, that first round at um, Tropo just now. and. Um, you know, he. I think he only ended up catching one wave. I don't know if he was like nervous or scared, or just worried about the world title ahead. He, who knows what's going through your mind when you're in the position that he was in at that time? He didn't need to go out and hurt himself at Tropo on a big day. There was no need for. It. He's, he's number one in the world, so he's gonna. No matter what, he's coming to Trestles, and uh, he looked really like down on himself after that heat. I just kind of thought. I said, dude, if you're going for a world title. Do not even. Don't worry about this week at all. 
Just go have fun. Enjoy your life. Go win the world title at Chapels, you know. And it, it could have been an obstacle, you know, for a year where he's got five finals, two wins, and the last feeling of a jersey. He's got to go, oh, wait, I've got a title to clinch at the Rip Curl WSL finals. Really impressive that he, he definitely put that out of his headspace to compete. Yeah, it's hard. Um, you know, you always... To go and win an event and then back that up, like it's almost better that you leading into this event that you don't have a great event. Um, you know, how many times we've we seen people go on, win the event, and go from hero to zero like that. Next event, they're out first heat. So it's hard to get over that mental blockage and then going into that. You talking about sunset this year, bro? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't, but we can. No. Uh, that was a little close to home there, Mick. <laughs> now that we opened that up. <laughs> yeah. That but, was no, uh, but yeah, I will. I will say though, Mick, like Mick, you were not a standout at Tropu in your early career. And then in O, what year was it? It seemed like you went. Did you? Didn't you go there and spend some time? And 07, just, I just spent a month. Oh seven. There. Yeah. yeah. And then you you won or got the final that year? I got second. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it, for me it was a huge stepping stone because I got that confidence that I could go and compete in those waves against the best. But uh, this is a really good wave. There's a nice and clean wave with a long wall. It things like looks like it's gonna link up all the way. If it stands up here for him, he could be looking at a big number ahead. So the board, it, it tends to um, kind of slide out and not drive. And that's kind of the point I was making earlier. It looks like it's really fast and sharp and precise, but it doesn't have a lot of drive to it. So I was wondering how that would play out. It's good in those little pockets there, though. Look at the turns you can fit in a tight, tight little space. As we see him throw the tail into reverse, he's a low Ferreira. Well, just had a one before that, so an important time to really start swinging with 19.45 to go. Split decision on his last wave in the previous heat, so he can't afford to lose at this stage. Coming from that first match earlier this morning, but we've seen how lethal he is when he can kind of quiet the noise. Back to that in a moment, because Felipe stepping into motion, clean. Big front side hook, he'll climb the next section, nice and hollow under that board. There's that layback dagger. A lot of variety once again. Frames it perfectly for the finish as he'll stare down the entire beach, Mick. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good surfing right there. Yeah. That's so precise. The speed, when we watch this replay, watch the speed he gets through these turns on. It's incredible. And um, he, he's just such a tack sharp surfer. We used to think about Mick and Rob Machado and Kalani Rob as being fast. This guy is the fastest guy I've ever seen. Look at that, boom, how much ground he covered there. Mark, Mick, talk us through this here. It's wild, he, he gets so much like reverberation out of his boards. Like his boards, sometimes you do a turn like that and your board will stop. His looks like it just explodes under yeah. his feet and po pops him back up on the water. Like every time he comes out of a turn, his board's clean, so he can just keep flowing into that next, uh, into that next turn. I like that climb he did there too. Like, even there, he's, like, totally underwater, but then he just pops up. It's, uh, it's those things feel good. <laughs> when you click them, right, and, it, yeah. and you, you get the lip to bounce you out, and you got speed in your finish instead of digging your nose or something. It's like a good exclamation mark yeah. at the end of a wave. It's, uh, what a great read for Felipe Toledo. Feels like he's in the flow state in total control. Yeah. Is he right by you, Strider? Uh, yeah, I just paddled by. You know, I, I, I always give the guys as they go by, you know, the claps and the let's go. And the, and the reaction, you know, you usually get something out of it. He's so focused and so laser into what he's doing. I love it. And the way that he's surfing right now, nobody's been surfing like that all day. He is taking it to the next level, and it, it looks to me like he's our world champion. Already calling it there with still 1740 to go. So Strider's feeling the energy out of Felipe and thinking it's going to be his day. We've got a 517 for Felipe to get rid of there. Italo's last a 633. But it's kind of like what Strider's tapping into is there's this energy, there's this kind of theme of the day. And I think what impressed me a lot, which might have been, a, actually I think you were pretty happy for the moment too to share it with Italo, was when there was this feeling of you at Bells in your last event and the energy was just willing the storybook ending for you to then get your fifth bell that day. But Italo was in his own world. He didn't there. care. He just, no. he had no respect. No, that's fine. No respect. <laughs> how, how impressive was that, Mick, where was, you see him just quieting all this noise that, you know, had a kind of a different formula for the end of the day. Yeah, and I think that's what it takes to win. You know, you, 
you don't want to sometimes you don't want to just buy into what's going on in the crowd like we've seen so many people that should have won an event but they started buying into what the crowd was saying yeah you're going to win this you've had nines every heat and then uh but yeah he just wasn't buying in it he's writing his own story and um and that's what you need to do especially in a moment like this you can't listen to the crowd it's it's you feel the crowd yes but you have to focus on yourself and you know be extra clear in the mind to uh, make the right decisions. Oh, it just reminds me of Snake winning pipe uh, when Bruce was getting chaired up the beach and there was still some time on the clock. Just it's never over till it's over. Italo gets the 6-3-3 saying that Toledo did improve. Best number of this match so far at a 7-8-3 and he still has priority with 16 minutes to go. To your point with uh, Jake Pato, a little shout out to our golf geek godfather. <laughs> um, Jake, best finish of all time, if you didn't watch it, in 98. Finishes the year in the barrel when the last hooter went off. Comes out, gets a 10, and beats Bruce Irons at backdoor. And it just, I think, the greatest finish that will ever happen in a, in a, a world, I mean, in a, in a world tour year. Fat last contest of the year at Pipeline. It, it, you couldn't have a better win. And just getting blown out of a barrel. It's yeah. so cool that Snake's still so heavily involved in pro surfing, not traveling as much as he has, but still giving intel on board ideas for Steph, Ethan, the told Tommy Whitaker crew as they be glued to the screen now. I'm sure a lot of pit people from his turf are going for Jack Robinson in that story today. As it's crazy how quickly we get to this point in this format as we have 15 minutes remaining to see if Felipe will achieve that first title, Mick. Yeah, it's crazy how fast the day goes. You know, I, I think, you know, talking to the kids that haven't been here before, it's like, once it starts, it's a fast day. You haven't got time to uh, sit around and, uh, you know, get on your phone and, and talk to people. It's like, once you're on, it's go time. And uh, yeah, it's, it's such a fast pace. And I think that's what's awesome too. You don't, for the people who are getting through the heats, they don't have time to stop and get nervous again. It's mm. just like they just keep going. Jump and then, on board or step aside. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's, I, I like it. It's been a lot of fun. We've got 14.25 on the clock to see if Toledo will clinch his first world title today or if Italo will force a third and deciding title match. We'll be right back. My job is professional surfer. My goal is to win titles. That's what I'm here for. The world's best surfers in the world's best waves. We've had a shark attack. Whoa. It's the most intense surfing scenario you can imagine. I have to step up my game now and not make any mistakes. Oh my God. <laughs> this is a war. You have to find a way to win it and do it at all costs. Back to earlier this season, Felipe had a pretty tough Hawaiian leg of the year. Didn't make the final series at either event, Pipe or Sunset. Even though he looked incredible at Sunset going down to Ewing. In Portugal, everything turned around. He's won this event before. It came down to a finals day where it looked like he'd be the favorite to win. Griffin just picked the better waves, finished runner up in that final, but then went straight to Bell's Beach. Won the big bell on his birthday and was able to really climb back into the driver's seat of the season. Went to defend his title out west, fell short, and got an equal ninth, and went for a few finals in a row. G-Land runner-up, El Salvador runner-up, ended up winning in Rio once again to equal Dave McCauley for most wins ever at the CT level in Brazil. Went to Jay Bay, worried about some shoulder injuries. He's always expected to win that event after he does double alley-oop rotations. And then the tough loss that he had early in Tahiti was a tough moment for Felipe before preparing for San Clemente. But he's definitely been leading, wearing the Hydro Flask leader's jersey. A special performance in 2022 as he's very close to a world title. After the heat he had with Kelly where he got one wave, he got 
plenty more barrels in his second effort and had about 18, 19 days off to then get back home, try mm. to find some normalcy, dropping the kids at school, trying to pretend the biggest day of his career wasn't leading ahead of him. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, uh, it's such a, um, a hard way to get through that downtime. It's like the, the disappointment of, of defeat so early, but then how do you pick yourself up? Like how many times you go into like the last event and you like you haven't had a great event before and then you're like all right i've got to try and find some confidence back yeah again to for sure go and put on a performance to win a world title just saw italo go down care kelly what happened it was just a, i think it was just a weird choice of wave i don't know why he's going in that wave i guess he saw the air section possibility but see how these waves just don't piece together very well like, there's a lot of downtime in between each maneuver you got to get to the bottom and find where that flow is again. And then you do it and you lose your speed. And I, I just don't think the left is the go today. Last year, it was big. There were some huge ramps. Obviously, Medina won it on the lefts. And, and it was definitely a go-to. But I, I don't see that being the bread and butter today. I think it's like the second, third wave of the set when they do come. I mean, if you have priority, it's hard to pass that first one up if it looks good. But you want to get that clean face. And uh, in, the, in their first matchup here in the final, uh, Italo almost came back and, and won that thing with that last wave he had. Kelly, I guess we've been talking a lot about this swallowtail quad that Felipe's been, been riding. Uh, 2012, were you on a swallowtail quad here at Lowers for a win? I rode against Parco. So I rode a four fin, yeah. Why does that design, design seem to It was really a round tail, though, mine. That was a round tail yeah, quad? Yeah, mine was a round tail quad. So that was the major difference. It feels like it's the recipe that's been working well for Felipe. Why do you feel like it works so well in these conditions? Because he shreds. <laughs> He's Simply just good in everything. Yeah, no, no but I think those four, four fins, small light board, He's doing those, he's, he's riding those, um, I think, vacuum bag carbon wrap boards, and they have a lot of life to them. They're like in a small wave, I think in a bigger wave, they don't feel that great, but in a small wave, they got a ton of life, and, and they push right back in your feet. You feel that energy off the wave. And with the four fins, he's getting a lot of fin base. Um, I don't typically like four fins on the face, on my forehand a whole lot, but at trestles, I do. It, it, just something about the way the curve of the wave is. It's a little flatter. You could almost probably get it. I mean, Mick, you probably ride some twin fins out here, I would imagine. And yeah, four fins don't work for me. I'll go yeah. twins. <laughs> <laughs> but I, this is one of the few waves on my forehand on a quad that I like it. Um, but it looks amazing for him. You saw what he did at Surf Ranch last time, too, that he rode that black quad. And he just murdered everyone. Everyone thought Medina was invincible, and he was the guy to beat, really. That was so cool to see Felipe turn that around, because that was kind of Medina's turf for several years. I know. Um, I thought it was my turf. Like, you <laughs> know, I was like, come be. on, come on. Yeah. Names <laughs> on it, too. Right my <laughs> that's, conspiracy that's, that's absolutely positive. I can't win that event. I, I haven't been able to get close. But uh, no, Medina and, and, and uh, Felipe and, and Yago, the three of those guys are unbelievable at Surf Ranch. They're just, I, I feel like, really on a different level, especially on the left. I almost think for Felipe, too, an advantage for him was just switching the order of rights and lefts um, on that day when he did win. As we look at the throw into the flats for Italo, Pulls that one out, but gets clipped by the next section. So he'll stick to that just one maneuver. Yeah, 2.0. <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> think of that. Think of that. Uh, oh, I don't know what he got, but I'm just saying, think of like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if you saw that, you'd be like, oh my God, there's a 10. Uh, your mind would be blown. It, but it, you just expect it out of these these two right here. That on their level, that was a two. Italo needs a 7.18 2019 world champion. Finished number three in the world last season. Winless this year, the finals kind of eluded him, but he still stayed incredibly hungry. He did mention at the press conference that he liked that he was under the radar. Big set here, and we'll see if uh, see if Felipe's in the right spot because this could be. Wow, he just let it go. Incredible, incredible patience and maybe knowledge of the wave. It's uh, it's actually was a good big clean wave, but it was mushy. Strider, how'd the wave look from your angle? Well, it looked like a, and it did. Felipe seeing exactly what he was going to do. Cause Catch up with Waz in a second. He'll get that water out of his mic in a moment. But yeah, interesting having that wave just go through unridden. Now with seven minutes on the clock, remember if Toledo wins this title match number two, it's all over. We saw on the women's side someone come from the first match. That was Stephanie Gilmore. 
and created history with an eighth world title. That's what Italo is trying to do this season. Coming from that first match this morning against Kanoa Garashi. As we got Waz back, what did you think about that wave that just went through? Well, you know what? We were, it was a, a great call by Felipe. I mean, the wave looked amazing. It came in, had a glassy first bowl on it, and it actually looked like it had an inside section, and then it was just disappeared. So whatever Felipe is seeing, he's got a pulse on this wave. It's unbelievable to see how well he's reading each and every wave that's coming through. Hmm. Wave selection so important. Especially here at Lowers. Mick, what does a good wave at Lowers look like? And is it easier said than done? Uh, yeah, for, for, for a wave that typically just looks as like it's the most perfect and easiest wave in the world to ride, the difference between the great waves and the good waves is so substantial. Um, you know, you want to have that wall that you can see just the long taper all the way through, but then it's also got like a, some, a bit of a teepee to start off, so you get that push with it. Um, you know, like that northwest wedge, a little west wedge yeah. in it. But then it, it depends on if you're a regular or goofy foot. Exactly. So <laughs> you, you have different waves. So yeah. like we we can on our forehand we can get away with a little bit slopier wave so we can get more calves in where the goofy footers want it to stand right up and bit so they can get super tight and critical. So they're both looking for different type of waves. There's a big set coming too. This is an interesting time because it's not a giant score that, that Ethelo needs to flip this heat. In, there just hasn't been many good waves or big sets in this heat. And so I feel like one big set will open this heat right up. And, uh, but you got Felipe has priority and he's got the choice of wave. He's in a commanding position. This is where you want to make the right choice. And you got to think that this set right here is one you don't pass up because there's nothing behind it. Oh my gosh, both of them, both of them uh, didn't go for it. That was really, that's a good wave, isn't it, Mick? I would have went. <laughs> That's a good wave. <laughs> but I, I think I think Felipe was smart because he doesn't need to go, and 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 uh, Italo put himself too deep, and in a weird spot, and um, now we got. Now we'll get a split both peak. Of them going. So Italo going left. He's loading up tail high reverse. He gets that without a problem. Can he combo it up? Front side wrap. Still a bit of la wave left on the lowers left. Nice searing carve. Italo wants another big punt. Stomps the reverse again on the finish. Great read, letting out a bit more emotion. His celebrations earlier was kind of quieting people down, but now he's trying to get the energy behind him. Well, what you have here is he's going to have to have, I, I, I think, uh, I didn't watch the whole way, but I think Felipe had a really good ride. But he's 1.5 points ahead on their better ride. So, so if Italo got the better of it, it has to be 1.5 points more than whatever Felipe just did. But Felipe, I watched his last two turns on the wave, and he, he had a full body claim, so I think he's happy with it. Let's see what happened. This was the split, Mick. What did you see here? Uh, I'll let you commentate it, Mike. <laughs> oh, the carved down to start and then went right back to the lip. How would you like that one, Mick? Yeah, mate. He's, look, he's been on point all day. He's uh, just going through. Like, even though this, there's foam on this space, he's just flying through it. That was a nice stomp to finish in. That's, look at that. Felt like he didn't try to run away with variety and just stuck to that real cool looking carve. This was the left, Kelly. Super crazy inverted, like corked out air. A uh, funny little carve there, and let's see how he finishes it. There's a little pocket of energy. And then, uh, you know, the, he's, he, and he flips it around. Just sheer will made that. I think for variety, you got to give it to Italo. Um, sheer number of, way, of of turns, it was Felipe and length of ride. But I, I feel like Felipe had a lot of repetitive turns in that wave. And th that's the first time it's felt like a shift to me. But it's, I don't think it's a big enough. Even if Italo got the better score, it wasn't 1.5 difference. It's not going to throw him into the lead. So whatever happens here, even if Italo got the better, I think he's going to need a, another wave to catch up, and there's just under three minutes. Interesting when you look at the difference, where there's moments that maybe looked forced on Italo's wave compared to a, mm. a constant succession of turns for Felipe, Mick. Yeah, look, I think uh, Italo's chasing down. He's trying to, to really reel it back in and forcing a little bit on that left. He is behind, so he needs to do something where Philippe sort of looks a little bit more in the flow zone and sort of letting his surfing just happen. Um, mm. But look, I, I think it's sort of, it's going to be more interesting to see if Philippe betters uh, Italo's 6-3-3 six, six, three, three and then see yeah. where, 
sort of I think that's going to be more comparison on where the, the scores sit yeah. coming in these last few minutes. Not well, he will it. he will better that 6-3, I think. Yeah. And then so then it's going to be like let's say two points over the 7-8-3 he needs. Let's break it down side by side here. Italo on the left, Felipe on the right. Kelly, what do you think? Gosh, I mean, the, the flow, you got to give the flow to, to Felipe. Obviously, he's already on a third clean turn, never down time, fourth turn. Here goes uh, Italo, the, the variety, a couple different types of air, one big sort of tail throw. Um, overall flow of the wave, uh, definitely speed and flow of the wave definitely went Felipe's way, but the, the variety and the, the, the risk goes to Italo. And uh, as Mick said, it's uh, he's trying to reel him in, and there's an 8.6. Am I seeing that right? That's Eight. right. Italo 8.6, yeah. and member Felipe on the splits. 7.8. Scores coming That's through for Felipe Toledo. 8.67, almost matching oh. each other on the right and the left. Toledo out front. Italo down to one minute. Needs a 7.91 to extend his season to one more match. I don't see a set out the back. This could be it. This could be Felipe's moment. And it, it just feels, it just has felt like Felipe's day all day. It felt like Steph's day all day. They did feel like the deserving champions. And we'll see if this clock runs out with 40, 40 seconds. There's only three more intervals of wave that can come in. And I don't see one between them and the buoy. Really impressed to get the split peak. Two different versions of ripping apart lower trestles. And Italo turned in his best score, 8-6. With 25 seconds, he still needs a 7-9-1. And I guess the thing going for him, he does have priority. He just needs a wave back. Yeah, that's all he need. <laughs> like, uh, these guys can do incredible things on pretty much anything, but uh, you still need some sort of a wave to get that sort of score. We are adding to the Brazilian dynasty today. 2013, this man was a rookie on tour. He's gone through heartbreak. He's gone through some pretty down times. It's the year of Felipe Toledo in 2022. Your champion of the Rip Curl WSL Finals and your 2022 world champ. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Congratulations to Felipe. I'm so happy for him. He didn't make the Olympic team. Can you imagine? The best small wave surfer in the world, in my opinion, and didn't make the, the, the small wave Olympics in, in Japan. And I thought it was such a heartbreak to not see him on that team. Um, but uh, you look at the other two guys for, that he had to compete against, and Italo wins the gold. Medina comes up just short of the bronze. Um, but w what a day for their family. Here's the other thing I noticed on the beach. There's a lot of Brazilians down here. There's a huge percentage of them were going for Felipe today. Like a really vocal majority were going for Felipe over Italo, which might have been really intimidating for Italo. Um, and, and you saw how calm and, and relaxed Felipe was all day. And Italo looked super serious. He was totally focused. It's just two different ways to get it done. And, and uh, you know, went Felipe's way today. Look at the guy. That's awesome. Uh, an emotional moment for Felipe Toledo, uh, a man that you've admired for a long time for his humility on land and what he does in the water. Mick, what does this title mean for pro surfing today? Yeah, he's a great kid. He's, um, you know, he's a, he's a family man. He became a family man at such a young age, and uh, so he's carried his family throughout. Uh, and he's just a, yeah, just a lovely guy on and uh, in and out of the water. Um, I think we've all sort of sat there and said his surfing is worthy of a world title, and um, he's been so close so many times. Today's his day. You start thinking of all those moments. I remember he had a heat with a wild card named Maxime Houssineau in France, where it, they were almost thinking about calling off the rest of the day. The conditions were really tough and awkward. He ended up losing to Mason at Pipe when he was in a great position for the title race. Uh, the back injuries that he's had, where it just basically took him out of really performing completely. And now to have this moment realized with his closest friends and family right here in San Clemente. Remember, he moved from Ubatuba a long time ago. He's been calling San Clemente home for many years now. Yeah, it's pretty special, isn't it? Uh, to, you know, to have that home vibe, uh, you know, sleep in your own bed, wake up with your family, do your, your normal thing that you do on a normal day. Um, it can go two ways. It can be too much pressure, but now he's, you know, he's in the elation of winning the world title at home with his family, with his friends, and uh, yeah, very well deserved. So cool to add to just the connection for Felipe Toledo as being the best surfer in the world. I caught up with him before the this whole thing started and I could tell he was trying to just stay in this happy place he was trying to just stay really light but 
it was actually real. It wasn't just a facade that he was putting on. He actually found that headspace he needed to stay in all week. He's, he's funny, you know, you think that, uh, you know, in situations, especially like this, you think that he's going to be, uh, you know, stressed out and, you know, pissed off or whatever, but he is so happy-go-lucky. I think that's, that's probably becoming a father at such a young age. You can never plan your day, so he's always happy. <laughs> yeah. um, he's always there for other people too, you know, for the other Brazilian guys, the young guys on tour. He, he really, he's really like, a, even though he's not an old guy, he's a father figure in a lot of ways at a young age, not only because he's a father, but that probably adds to it. And he, he, um, he's like a stable, calming force, I think, for that Brazilian Storm team. And they all look up to him, and it's, 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 I'm so happy it's his day. It's really true. Sometimes you kind of have to protect yourself as a world champ. You know, Medina, for some years, kind of did his own thing just with family, where Felipe was just always with the Storm. He was always there, win or lose, supporting him. And I was like, hey, Felipe, do you ever like some quiet time? He's like, absolutely not. He doesn't like being by himself. <laughs> He, he wants to be supporting his, uh, his favorite surfers. He wants to feel high energy. This has got to be the best feeling in this young man surfing to career of world champion today here at Lowell Trestles. a wonderful moment for the whole Toledo family. Ricardinho, multiple time Brazilian national champ back in the day. Surfs for so many people as he is getting completely swarmed by fans, by media. The feeling when you can finally let go. You know, how long ago Pike felt, the mid-season cut. Five finals, two wins, the talk hyping up into this moment. What's he feeling, Mick, as he finally can enjoy the best moment of his career? Oh, I think it's the things that you don't see on camera. It's those waking up at 2 a.m. and you've got these things going through your head. Can I do it? Can I do it? Talking yourself, you know, from the darkness of when you do lose a heat and bring yourself back up. There's so many p moments that you don't see on camera or no one else sees it's just you and you have to deal with that and um in these sort of situations it's you never know how you're going to feel you know sometimes you're just like in warrior mode and you're about to rip your shirt off and then other times you just crumple in because you're an emotional mess uh so it's it's such a yeah you never know which way it's going to go mm -hmm. but um other way it does go it's 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 real like this moment is real I was going to make one one other point about the Chopo thing, you know, because there still is that there still is those eyes on on him. There's a lot of room for improvement in Felipe still, and he's he's the best in the world right now, and that's the scary thing. And uh, you, I know as your competitor, when Mick went and I heard he went and st spent all that time with Chopo, and then it paid off, and he got second that year. I was like, oh man. And so it, with with Felipe, there's there's it, it's amazing to think that there's still a lot of growth that could happen in his serving. So scary. Eh? Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's incredible. He's such a talent. And then the accomplishment as well, Kelly, for those thoughts that can creep in your head. Maybe this won't happen. He qualified in 2013. Yeah. And to finally go all the way. Incredible. I, actually, I remember seeing him at the U.S. Uh, the Junior uh, U.S. Open. And he was in the final with Connor and there was, there was, uh, maybe Evan. John and John. John John. And, and everyone had eyes on him and he smoked them all. And I went, this guy is going to be something. That junior final felt like yesterday. Now look at the man he is today. A family man, a world champion. 
Uh, so feel for Ricardo, you know, this guy has been there every step of the way. Just he used to irritate that crap out of all of us who've been in the, in the surface area whistling and throwing, you know, waving his orange shirt, and it was just driving us nuts. And uh, it, it, it just must be just such a rewarding foot feeling as his dad for him to have this day. Let's hear from the man who will send it to Rosie Hodge. Thank you guys so much. I'm letting it all soak in. Felipe, you've come so close so many times. You've just won your maiden WSL world title. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a feeling that obviously I never felt before. But it's just like the relief, you know, like the all hard work of nine years, you know, sacrificing a lot. My family, you know how hard it is to leave your kid behind. And, uh, you know, like how, how, you know, like how hard our work for, for all of this and for this moment, for my family, you know, like and to see this park in everybody's eyes of my family, it was, you know, there's nothing, you know, there's no price, you know, and uh, World title for me, it's the, one of the most important, you know, um, goals of my career. But, you know, like, to see God's work throughout my life and my family's life, for me, that's a big win. You know, I just got to thank Jesus. And the last week was pretty crazy. Went through a lot. Not in a bad way, but it was just a lot going on. And, you know, and he clearly told me that he was going to be like, a, not an easy path, but, you know, like, he was going to give it to me. And then, you know, he kept his promise. And I'm here. I'm, I still can't believe it. I still can't believe it. It's, Surfing against your fellow countryman, Itzlo Ferreira, for that world title. How sweet was that? Uh, yeah, it was next level, you know, what Italo did uh, today, coming from, you know, first seat of the day all the way to the finals. Um, you know, I know this place really well, and uh, my strategy, you know, was really good, and, you know, I was getting the waves, like second waves of the set, or the medium ones that was cleaner, you know, less, cho less choppy, and then, you know, like steeper too, I just couldn't, you know, like really uh, apply big turns and throw some spray. And uh, yeah, I'm in mean, super stoked. Felipe, there's a lot of Brazilians on the shoreline supporting you. There's a lot of young children that you have inspired back home in Brazil. Give us some words in Portuguese. Ah, pô, queria agradecer todo mundo, minha família, os meus amigos. Ainda tô sem acreditar. É, é um sentimento estranho, é, de tipo muito feliz, mas ao mesmo tempo eu não tenho palavras. Eu tenho que agradecer muito a Deus que Ele cumpriu a promessa. Ele falou que ia é, me honrar e, e Ele honrou. Então uh, toda, honra, toda honra e glória seja dada a Deus. Does it feel as good as you thought it would, winning this world title? Oh, it's even better. <laughs> even better. What about having your dad right next to you? Oh, uh, it was awesome, you know, like all the work that we did the past nine years, and now he's been home, you know, for the last few years, and, uh, and you know, like even from home, you know, like giving me advices and uh, even like snapping on me sometimes, but, you know, that's that duty. Uh, and, you know, now that I have a kid, I know how much love, you know, it's involved and uh, it's just different, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, next level. Felipe, congratulations. We're so incredibly proud of you. It's been such an amazing day, guys. We're going to send it back to you. Thanks so much, Rosie. Felipe Toledo, the world champion. What a special day in pro surfing history. Uh, Mick Fanning, Kelly Slater, honored to be sitting next to you for the call on such an important day for the world of surfing, from Steph getting eight to Felipe having his dream realized as well. What a day. Uh, <laughs> like, to have two people come from the very first heat all the way through was awesome. Um, and, yeah, everyone just went at it. And once again... Yeah, the cream rose to the top today. Uh, Steph got over a, a giant hill. She probably had a lot of doubt in her mind. She has had a few off years the last few years and hasn't had the magic she had at one point. But we all know it's there, you know? I know Mick, growing up watching her surf, surfing with her, known her forever, knows that it's there. She just needs to turn it on and, and find it. And uh, I'm just so happy, so so pleased for, for both these champs. Um, Felipe is, uh, you know, one of my all-time favorite surfers, one of my favorite guys I've ever known on tour. Um, you can see how humble he is, how humble he is by the moment, and how appreciative he is of all the people around him and his faith and and um, his belief in himself and his knowledge. It's, it's 
it's it's really fitting. I think a lot of us, I think a lot of kids coming up can learn from all that. And um, he's a great role model, and, and uh, it, was, it was a great day. Good man, Kelly. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Mick. All time. All right, what a special day in surfing Thanks, history. Man. Really enjoyed Kelly. the call and insight from a couple of legends of the sport. Let's continue the celebration as we congrats Stephanie Gilmore and Felipe Toledo once again. Coming up next is the 805 Post Show with Ronnie Blakey, Laura Enover, and Peter Mel. Take care, guys. We'll see you at the awards. Number two in the world in 2021, Felipe Toledo. It is Felipe Toledo's destiny to be the 2022 world champion. That's the goal, going for the title. Excited with the new calendar. And the WSL finals at Trestles again. Felipe's had an incredible season. He is competitively fearsome. He has it all. Falling from the clouds. This is the best season of his life. I feel like he's way more mature. Let's see if he's going to be the next world champion. Probably. All the heat rings, all the <laughs> moments with my family, with my friends. What a monstrous! It means a lot. This turn is absolutely learning. Your champion of the Rip Cold Pro Bells Beach, Felipe Toledo. Looks for the wrap alley oop. It's a huge one and stomps it. Air reverse wow. for finish. And those are the combos that make Felipe Toledo so dangerous. Setting it up, one big move. And oh my goodness, that was crazy. Your champion of the Oil Rio Pro, Felipe Toledo. Number one seed locked. Felipe Toledo's got it. Your winner of the Rip Curl WSL Finals and 2022 World Champion is Felipe Toledo. Welcome to the 805 Post Show, and what a show it's going to be here at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. What a way to finish things off. Our champions have been crowned. Ronnie Blakey with Laura Annabelle and Peter Mel. Laura, your initial thoughts after what was a monster day? 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all you got for me? I'm not surprised. No, it, it was awesome though, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, really, uh, we saw the, the best rise up today. Stephanie Gilmore was just a, a woman on a mission. Well, yeah, I really can't even uh, comprehend everything that's happened today. It's been a long day, but, you know, short in the scheme of things with this year. It's been a, you know, a huge calendar year. And then to finish on today, what an incredible, you know, showing and uh, the stories that unfolded. I can't wait to unpack them all. And we have two new world champs. We sure do. Uh, Peter, the, those lower seeds really pushed hard today. It was impressive. Completely different to, to last year's Rip Curl WSL finals. We could have gone 20 years until we saw someone from that first match get all the way to a world title. Um, and it happened in the very second year, which is incredible. I mean, the feat that we saw Stephanie do here to do what she did today, five heats, winning every single one of them all the way through and win her eighth world title incredible feat you talk about the the goat of the sport she was trying to give it uh, as much as a way to carissa but ultimately stephanie uh, she earned it today and every bit of it and, uh, it and never once showing any fatigue in my eyes i mean every wave was full on 100 percent and it never looked like she was tired whatsoever i mean she could have gone another three heats yeah they're gonna have a, a close look at, at steph's road to, to victory here today but right now let's have a look at the men's bracket and see what unfolded it, it was really destiny today felipe toledo he, he's been so worthy of a world title he's been in contention in the past he couldn't be beaten here last year by anyone but gabriel medina medina not here this year and he rightfully got his first title and and i and i felt wholeheartedly that felipe is the best out here at trestles um just everything he brings to the table is uh you know top three in the world it's his errors are right there his car work his speed all of it his linkage his wave choice um his team everything uh, so it was destiny for him today, and it would have been a heartbreak to see him not take his world title, considering how the season he had. There's still work to do in his arsenal, right? We could all say it. Oh, yeah, Tahiti. We want to see him do better in Tahiti. That's the one thing. I don't care, dude. He surfed so good all the way through this season. Uh, impressive performances all the way out there. And, and uh, again, knowing that he has some growth in him, I mean, we could see him doing this again for another five, six, seven t world titles. Yeah, even Kelly Slater mentioned that. There, there's still growth in his surfing. We'll see him evolve. Uh, if he wants to put that time in at those venues, he's got the technique oh. to really start collecting big results there. Yeah, we saw it in Heat too. Uh, you know, uh, at Heat, I mean, he had two amazing waves, and it's just a matter of him just digging, you know, an extra couple strokes, and it's all there. Let's have a look at the women's bracket now. This was the, the remarkable story today. Stephanie Gilmore, fifth seed coming into this contest, and have a look at the surfers that she had to overcome. Absolutely unbelievable. I mean, Steph was in this same heat last year and it was heartbreak. She was out first, you know, the first heat of the morning. We, she, she didn't have her feet for the first three waves uh, where she took off this morning and, and she had to come from behind to just get through that heat with Brisa. She had a tight heat with Tatiana. She dominated the heat with Joanne and then into those two back-to-back -back final matches with Carissa Moore and she took them both convincingly and we spoke about it Pete these two uh, really hadn't battled for, for world titles they had kind of sleepy years when the other was on fire but this year we got that 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 great showdown there and Steph really took control early we, we got the storybook right and uh, you know whoever you were voting for in that last final you know I think that that's what we wanted to see was that matchup and it went Steph's way uh, again very gracious trying to give it a, you know the world title to Carissa but I'll tell you this is what the format is they're all signed up for it right this is the finals day and you're gonna get sometimes where an upset happens even if you've dominated the whole year you got to be able to perform in this this type of format this final uh five was so impressive and i and i please don't ever change it uh it's been so good for surfing it really has uh, Carissa and Steph Gilmore, what a remarkable battle it was. Carissa, of course, chasing a sixth world title, trying to track Steph down, but Steph looking to break the deadlock with Carissa, with Lane Beachley, sorry, and she's finally got it done there, and it's, it's been a, a mission to get there. Yeah, Lane and Steph have been on seven for a long time now, but, uh, yeah, Steph finally cracked the eight. She's in number 88. Today's the 8th of September. She got an eight in the final. There's lots of eights Whoa, flying around. Look at you. I don't know, I'm not superstitious, she is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was a, a magic performance, that's for sure. But it's been a magic career, and we're going to reflect on some big world title moments for Stephanie Gilmore, going way back to her first title. Just uh, amazing when she burst onto the scene. She was so dominant, winning multiple events, and she was hard to stop. She had an incredible run. She just kept racking up the world title victories four on the trot and then Carissa Moore came on the scene and started to get a few back from her but 
It's just remarkable to think that now she's 34 years of age and she's not slowing down at all. Had a CT victory this year, has capped off the year with that eighth, eighth world title. It's just remarkable stuff. Think she can go for uh, Kelly's 11? Absolutely. Right? Let's just spur it on, right? Let's just keep feeding it. But Steph Gilmore is officially the greatest ever, and that is spelled with an eight. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Just a, a massive emotional moment for her out there in the lineup. She really, I, I think, pieced the puzzle together after a really sloppy start in the opening match, saved herself. There was a little trip up with priority from Brisa, and, and Steph capitalised, and after that, she just didn't look back. She just looked so intent on, on getting to that goal. You felt the momentum just shift. It's like it just flooded over her and she took that into the next heat. And it was like that, you know, this whole year has been quite, you know, all over the place with Steph. She missed pipe. She lost out of sunset early. She had to fight her way into that top uh, to make the cut, sorry, at Margaret River. And then to make this top five, she has been fighting so hard all year. And I think this is, you know, the whole year wrapped up and that momentum finally came to her in that first heat and she took it and ran. Yeah, her, her, her best was on show today, Pete, those yeah. rail turns, that, that seamless flow. And when Steph's on, she, she links it together, together better than anyone. It's so true. Uh, and, and it got better and better, too. I mean, even with Tati, Tati had already put like an eight and a, and a high five against her before Steph even got in a wave in that in match number two. Um, and then she got the set and, and, and matched it, right? And then built upon that. And then the momentum just kept going her way. And it just felt like it was destiny. Uh, you know, this first heat here was, like you mentioned, a very tough start. We were going, uh oh, are we going to see this happen again? You know, and Brees is going to get this glorified run. But uh, it didn't happen because Steph came back with guns ablaze. And then it's where it started. And it didn't stop. Unbelievable. And then straight into a, her second match with Tatiana Weston Webb. I thought this one was extremely close and probably could have gone either way. But I think the judges really did uh, stamp the big number for Steph with her progression. Yeah, you know, she really manufactured that score. It was a small wave and she made it happen. And then she took all of that confidence into this heat with Joanne DeFay. And she got 16 points plus, two eight-point rides. Just didn't even let Joanne get out of the gates, really. And this is where the confidence you could just see was oozing out of her ears. Steph is obviously a, a very strong woman, but sometimes competitively when there's nerves, it looks like she's maybe lacking some strength in the legs and we see incompletions. Not today, no. after the, the first couple of balls peak, she really cleaned things up and she attacked in sections. She drifted the fins and threw a couple of reverses at us. It was, I mean, that was in the style of surfing she was using here, it did take a lot of strength. I mean, there was holding of the rail all the way through those moves. I mean, it was digging in, it was all the way to the end, pushing the fins. And so you're gonna get fatigued doing that style of surfing, but she didn't look frail at all. She just went from strength to strength. It was unbelievable. And she put the pressure on Carissa Moore. We've seen Carissa get in that, you know, in, into that situation last year, but she just didn't even let her get out of it. We were talking about some of those new contenders chasing a maiden world title, trying to stop Steph's momentum through the contest. The key has always been against these multiple world champions, get that first big number on the exchange. And Steph did that to Carissa in both their matches. She got the good number to kick things off and, and didn't back down. It's so cool to see. I mean, that's a, a championships form. Uh, again, I, I really, whatever she did to get prepared for this event it worked right if it was uh, you know the, the moment of, of solitude uh, you know the training that she did it uh, I mean I don't really know exactly what she was doing but ultimately that recipe yeah keep on it I relish the opportunity to sit back and listen to Mick Fanning and Kelly Slater two surfers who've experienced those world title moments so often and Mick saying you, you never really know how you're gonna react in that moment and Steph obviously Really focused all day, Laura, but then just let it all out uh, when she hit the beach. She did. She was emotional, and you could just tell how much this meant to her. She's been wanting to crack that seven for a long time, and she got it done. And I think, yeah, this is, you know, like she said in all of her post seat interviews, you know, this is an emotional victory, and this is, you know, a collection of everything that she's worked for her whole life. So amazing job. we got more coming on the 8.05 post show, but right now it is time to crown our champions. We'll throw it to Joe Tapel. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you, everybody here locally here in Southern California that came down for the biggest day in pro surfing of the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Thank you so much for showing up. Give you guys yourselves a round of applause. You're a part of pro surfing history today.
This is the Rip Curl WSL Finals, just in the second ever edition, creating a format where we crown our champions in the water. And it's not just from anyone on tour, it's the final five. And to get there, it's almost impossible. Thinking about how we started off this year at Pipeline, the first season ever from start to finish, where we had men and women competing at the same venues, all the way from Pipe to Tahiti. And what about the mid-season cut at Margaret River? A grip round of applause for the entire tour and the pro surfers that give their heart and their passion as they're dedicated to turn in their best each and every event. What a great time for the WSL to really open this event and formally recognize that Trestles is the modern name of the ancient Ahashiman village site known as the Panhe. The Ahashiman people have lived in this place that we call Orange County for over 10,000 years and are still here stewarding the land alongside surfers, environmentalists, and others who care about our shared coastline. We thank them for their ongoing presence and participation in this event. We'd like our pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Thank you so much. Very special individual up here with us that we just love so much. It reminds us of coming here to this part of the world. She has such a warm heart and a warm welcome for all of you. I'd like to introduce Adelia Sandoval, spiritual overseer of the Juaneno Band of Mission Indians, also known as the Ahashiman Nation, who will say a few words. Thank you very much. I am so happy to be here to represent the Ahashiman people, the indigenous people of this land. And we are so happy that we were able to participate with the World Sur Surf League and all of the other sponsors and all of the other beautiful people. And I want to thank the San Onofre Foundation and the Coalition to Protect Panhe and Native Like Water because we've been working together to protect this ocean and this land for generations to come. And I also want to say, I want to say a beautiful word. I, I, I want you to, I wish I could teach it to you. Maybe you, some of you will catch on. It's a lo mahna li mi vuktum. And what that means in our language is surf dancers. And that's exactly what was going on today. They were dancing with the ocean. So I just want to share that word because I love that word. And that's a, a beautiful thing. So thank you again for honoring the people of this land. You, you don't know how much that means to us because we've been forgotten, we thought. But no, not today and not this time. So yes. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you so very much. Beautiful opportunity to continue the thanks to the local community here in San Clemente for sharing this amazing wave with us. You guys are extra special. All you guys know who you are that run this lineup on each and every day. We can't thank you enough. Also want to thank Congressman Mike Levin, the San Clemente Mayor Kathy Ward, Mayor Pro 10 Jean James, San Clemente City Council members Chris Duncan, Laura Ferguson, and Steve Noblock. Also big thanks to the California State Parks, Lori Coble, Mark Allen, State Park Superintendent Scott Kibbe. We also want to thank our Southern California We Are One Ocean Coalition partners who have supported us at this event, Native Like Water, San Onofre Parks Foundation, and the Surf Rider Foundation as well. Let's give them a round of applause. They've done so much for this event. We also have our title sponsor to really thank here for our store competition once again. Big thanks to Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company, for their partnership across professional surfing throughout the whole year, leading all the way up to the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Just maxes out their support for pro surfing for now and the future. Thank you to our event sponsors, Red Bull, Oakley, Turtle Bay, 805, Flying Embers, Sambazon, Tequila Eterno Verano, Shiseido, Pura Vida, Hydro Flask, Expedia, 805 Beer, Alaska Airlines, Fuwax, True Surf, and Turtle Bay. Thank you for all the great support. Some amazing people up here on stage that work tirelessly for pro surfing so that surfers can live their dreams and so your fans can live their dreams. Let's hear it for Jesse Miley Dyer, WSL SVP, the tour's head of competition. Astounding job once again, Jess. We can't thank you enough. And also right next to her, the CEO of the World Surf League, our fearless leader. We will follow you wherever you go. We'll warm welcome for CEO Eric Logan. And I wouldn't mind if you said a few words. Thank you, Joe. We're going to keep this very brief. But first of all, 
How was today for the final five? Yes. No question that we are crowning the undisputed world champions in the water for the first time in the history of pro surfing for the second consecutive year. I'd like to say a special thank you to our title sponsor and to my partner, Brooke Ferris, again from Rip Curl. Thank you for everything, the ultimate surf company. We will appreciate your support. And I want to say thank you to all of the 10 finalists and all of our championship tour surfers all year for what they have done and they've committed to make the year what it is. And what a day we've had today. How about witnessing history long overdue from brazil number 77 the first ever world championship for felipe toledo let's give it up for him yes 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 and we witnessed a second historic moment something that we may never ever see again on one of the greatest days in the history of pro surfing watching one of the greatest to ever do it stephanie gilmore come from the five seed run the table and win her undisputed eighth world title stephanie gilmore I want to be the first to say this to stephanie and to the world Stephanie, you are the greatest, and we will spill great with eight. Great with eight. So with that, I do believe, Mr. Trapel, we have some hardware to hand out. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your support all year. Thank you for your love of pro surfing, and let's bring out our champions. Thank you so much, Hilo. Without further ado, let's really make some noise. What a year it's been for your 2022 world champion, Felipe Toledo. What a year it's been for Felipe. Nine long years on the championship tour. 2013 rookie started winning events in 2015. We don't have to wonder anymore. We don't have to talk about the hype. We don't have to talk about the what ifs. Your dream is officially realized. You are the world champion, Felipe. How is it sinking in? It doesn't get much better than this, you know. Um, uh, first of all, I, you know, I want to thank Jesus. Um, <laughs> you know, like the, what he did throughout my life, you know, in the last week and, well, the entire year. And, you know, like a lot of, a lot of times, you know, I was really close to, um, you know, like, just you know like not really understand things and 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 just you know i kept calm and collected and that came from from the guy up there and um and last night we had you know we had a moment with uh pastor john and taryn ananda my wife uh my family was you know praying to and um two words that you know um uh, he gave it to us peace and power and that's what I had out there, you know, I had a lot of peace and, you know, like I was just waiting on the right waves and surfing it with, you know, like calm um, and, you know, just releasing the power in the waves and with the energy of everybody. But um, after that, you know, my family, we've been doing this, we've been doing this for nine years and, you know, it's, uh, it pays off in the end, you know, and whoever, you know, is chasing your dreams, it does pay off. You know, it's it's hard. Um, it's hard. You get tired. Lots of ups and downs. Uh, a lot of you know really bad thoughts. But um, you know, we did it. We did it. And this is going to be here. This is for Brazil. This is for my family. Um, and this is for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Felipe Toledo, world champion. Finals, 
two wins and winning the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Just the other day we talked about what it would be like and you had to stay calm and ready to compete. Now that you can let go, is it starting to realize what a world champion means to you? Um, not yet, man. It's too much to digest, you know, all the, the waves and uh, seeing what Italo did, you know, the entire day coming from first heat of the day all the way to the finals. And um, I don't know, man, it's just, you know, just the entire year of what I did and um, how, you know, I, I dealt with everything that happened. And I feel like it's going to take a few days to, to, you know, to sink in, to really understand what's going on. but. Right now, it, it does feel amazing. <laughs> You've done it. You're the best surfer in the world, Felipe. Enjoy your moment. You're 2022 world champion. Taking out the Rip Curl WSL Finals. I want Felipe to stay here because we've got more hardware to hand out. This surfer qualified back in 2007, won a world title in her rookie year, shared a title with, a shared a record with Lane Beachley with seven titles, but now she stands alone. Now, let me introduce the greatest, an eight-time world champion, Stephanie Gilmore. <laughs> Stephanie Gilmore went four in a row, and the tour just got better and better. And now finally to get eight, Steph. Step on this way. I know you've held a few of these before. Congratulations. We've said that to you a lot of times. You can rest it if you'd like. Yeah, hang on to it. Winning your title so early, so young, it came so naturally, and they just get harder and harder to do it. And a season where you're missing events at the start out of your hands to where you're standing today has got to be one of the most heroic years of your career. How are you feeling now on the stage? Yeah, I've uh, won a lot of titles in different ways, and, and this, to be honest, was the best win I've had. To, to come all the way from fifth and just grind it out all the way to the final, I, you know, I, I knew it was possible, and you know, I could try and conserve some energy and, and make it work, but I'm against, you know, Brisa, Tati, Joanne, Carissa, they're all my favorite female surfers, they're incredible, and, and I knew it would be tough, but yeah, I'm stoked I had a shot at it, and here we are. Anything's possible. This is so cool. You've had some fine moments with Riss over your career. A couple of years ago when this format was introduced, I asked her if there was one surfer she'd won in the title match. She mentioned your name. It wasn't like a secret. She was like, I'd love to have stuff. Sometimes you guys missed each other over those title showdowns, but you finally got to share the water together to the most decorated surfers in the sport. What did it mean to you to have Riss in there? Yeah, sitting out there in the final uh, next to Carissa, I was just admiring her, her strength and, and her humbleness. And she's, you know, she's the best female surfer in my eyes. So to sit there and, and battle it out for a world title against her was the greatest moment in my career. So I'm really, really happy that I was able to push through and, and get the win. And, you know, Carissa had such a stellar year um, on the rankings. And, and in, my, in my eyes, she's really the, the world champion. But... This is so cool that we were able to come down here and battle it out and, and uh, I was able to get the win, so I'm freaking so stoked. <laughs> well, now you hold the record all to yourself. You've got eight. Seven-time world champion Lane Beachley's watching. What would you like to say to Lane? <laughs> Hi, Lane. <laughs> now I want to say thanks, Lane. Thanks for paving the way and showing us what's possible. And. It was always a, a dream of mine to win eight world titles, and uh, you know, eight's a really nice looking number. Um, I actually didn't think I was gonna get there, but wow, this is, this is really special, and I'm, I'm really honored to, to be able to hold that record, and, and thank you for all that you've done, Lane. And um, yeah, I actually, just, I also wanna say, like, Felipe, you are the coolest guy ever. So happy. Felipe has deserved to be world champion for a long time and yeah, really the most amazing surfing all year. And yeah, such uh, such 
such an honor to share the stage with you. Thank you. <laughs> what a great moment for world champions, two of the very best. Steph, I know you probably have a lot of people to thank, changing surfing history. And I love that you said that this has the most meaning to you, because we ask you all the time which title means the most or what will it mean for one more. And to have you sitting here to have this one realized as your biggest accomplishment is huge. Who would you like to thank? How my family and my friends, you know, without, without you guys, without the support, or ongoing support from, you know, since I was 12 years old and decided I wanted to be the best female surfer in the world, it was like, all right, let's, let's do it. And, and uh, my coach, Tom Whitaker, he's been awesome this year. We've had a lot of fun. Um, Kanoa and Griffin, we've had a lot of fun traveling together and learning from each other. Um, and then, yeah, I'd like to thank Roxy and... Darren Hanley, actually, he made me a really sick board right before this comp started. And yeah, it held true. It was the first time I wrote it when I got here this week and it's an epic surfboard. So thank you, Darren, you're a legend. Um, my, yeah, who else? I don't know, everyone, you guys all rule, woo! One more time for Stephanie Gilmore, a true legend of the sport and eight-time world champion. Coming from the number five seed, Felipe Toledo, his first world title in 2022. Thank you everybody here at Lowers for joining us for a special part of surfing history. We'll send it back to Ronnie Blakey on the 805 Post Show. Thank you so much. Good on you, Joe, and great job down there on the main stage. There are your champions for 2022. Very deserving. Step breaking through for the eight. Felipe Toledo getting his first world title, but do you get the feeling there's more coming down the line, the, the way he serves with that growth that we were talking about before, Pete, you know, it could be a dominant force here. Looking at, you know, our schedule, we're going to most likely have a, a new addition here and there, right? But we're going to have those staples where Felipe is really dominant. You know, you think about J-Bay, you think about Bells, uh, you think about, uh, you know, El Salvador, like places that those are, this is going to be right up his alley. He's going to be a contender for a long time. And then there's the, the events that you're going to see some growth, you know, and I think that that's something that just, a, it's just a switch. It really is, because the talent is there, the, the ability is there, it's all there. Um, and it, as we can see, it, it, it's incredible. Um, you know, and I think we may have a venue change, right, for our finals. Uh, you know, that could be a, a something down down the line, right? And ultimately, I think you're going to have to to adjust to it. But that experience right now uh, of him having that number one seed in this in this finals and to turn it and make it happen and get it done, and he seemed like the, the guy to beat, and it, ultimately he was. Goat fest on the main stage. <laughs> Kelly Slater and Stephanie Gilmore there. Amazing. 19 world titles collectively. <laughs> Incredible. 20, if you include Felipe. Uh, it was amazing to hear just the support, the, the thank yous to obviously family and friends. Obviously, Felipe living here uh, in San Clemente and, and, you know, obviously had a, a big turnout. Uh, but Steph has always kept it pretty low profile. Sometimes her, her family turns up. It was Whitney here. Her sister, um, but I know back home they'd be watching on and probably wiping tears away because it's been a, a big emotional day for them. But both surfers had their shapers here as well, which was pretty cool. I, I love that they were able to acknowledge them because I feel like that's a big part of it. The equipment is so huge. And, uh, you know, Darren putting a little magic surfboard underneath Steph's feet. Uh, it, it looked very similar to what she's been riding, you know, throughout the year. But ultimately, there's something that has to happen for this event because it's one day you got to have that magic board under your feet. And if you have that, that confidence is going to carry you. And it did. It carried her for Steph. And then also Mark. Marcio Zuby getting his first world title. Uh, he's deserved it. He had, you know, as many surfers as he had last year, and then he had this year to finally get that world title. So congratulations to Sharpay. Yeah, most definitely. Let's have a look at the uh, men's road to the final, or, or Felipe Toledo's road to this victory. Uh, he was waiting to see who, who he'd come up against, obviously. He had a fantastic chance. He's so strong at this venue, Laura. He didn't disappoint. Yeah, he turned up pretty late in the day, you know. He, he just hung at home with his family and showed up and was totally on. Came out firing with his 7.5, I think it was, and we knew straight away the confidence was oozing and he was just, just switched into that gear that he had been in last year. So Felipe just showing incredible signs off the bat. Back on the quad, Pete. Uh, his control with that board, where he chooses to place it and push it to the point of release, is pretty unique. 
It is, and it ultimately, I think you can talk to obviously the the construction being the dark arts construction done with sharp eyes shaping abilities. So there's got to be a, a refinement in that style of surfboard. And then you've got the FCS2 H4 fins, which are meant to go really fast and hold in. And we can see that it's working for him. Um, you know, it's something that he didn't want to stray from because it's not like this board comes out at every event. Matter of fact, it kind of only really comes out here at Trestles. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so strong. I, I did chat to four-time world champ Mark Richards and just got his thoughts on Felipe coming in as the number one seed. He, he said to me he is so deserving of that world title, his rail game, his air prowess, uh, definitely worthy uh, of winning that crown. And, you know, he, he's just made for this new format, and that's what makes him such a threat. He's a, he's a, a big showman, and... I mean that in the kindest way. He's not a show off. He yeah, just no. really loves to work a crowd. He's an entertainer. Yeah, and, and ultimately it's with performances like that, which he's just shown. And I, again, we came in the very first day we come into this event. Uh, Felipe was the man to beat. He was the best surfer at Trestles. Uh, and there's guys that could beat him in those moments. But ultimately, if you're going to look at it as a, a whole surfer, he is the man to beat here. And for him to go number two last year, number one this year, must feel very, Where's he going to go sweet. next year? Well, he has to do another title, right? I mean, that's ultimately what you do. If you're going to come back, come next year, it better be another title. <laughs> it was an, another very strong performance here from Italo Ferreira. And with his big air of the day, he's going to take our flying embers moment. Let's check it out. Italo, he's got that look to him. Spring loaded, tail high, full oh, rotation punt. Butter, straight butter right here. I really did well to get himself into a, a shot for a second world title here this year, Pete. Uh, it, it, it was a year that had some moments, but he didn't get that big breakthrough win. But I feel like it's going to give him a, a lot to, to launch from heading into next season. For sure. You know, and I think that, uh, you know, that it was it was a challenging year for him. Um, it wasn't easy for him to get scores like it was in the past. And I don't know if it was just the, the, the type of conditions he had to surf in uh, ultimately, you know, but uh, we didn't get to see as many big airs like we usually see from him. And I think a lot of it had to do with conditions. Maybe he was just trying a different approach. Uh, but I think that we need to see that style of surfing from Ito. That's what we expect from him. Um, and he has such high consistency. And, and you know, he, he could have done it on those lefts. He was eyeing it. And, you know, he, he pulls one of those full rotations. We could be into, you know, match number three, heat number three. Well, uh, Trestles, it's a special place, and we want to celebrate those that are helping to protect it, Surfrider in particular, and the great work that they're doing with We Are One Ocean. Hey, this is Chad Nelson, CEO of the Surfrider Foundation. I'm here at Trestles, one of California's most iconic surf spots and part of San Onofre State Beach. It's important to recognize that Trestles is a significant site of Native American history. Miyuyam. My name is Avelia Sandoval. I am the spiritual overseer of the one annual band of Mission Indians, a Hashiman Nation. We are the indigenous people of Orange County. This beautiful stretch of land and ocean, famously known as Trestles, dwells in the arms of two locations, Keeshpamai, also known as San Onofre, and Panhe, a prominent village site that is at least 12,000 years old. We proudly join together with the Surfrider Foundation and WSL to preserve and protect these lands and oceans for future generations. Hi, I'm Steve Long. I'm the retired lifeguard chief for San Onofre State Beach and also the founder of the San Onofre Parks Foundation. The San Onofre Parks Foundation and other groups have been working diligently for the last seven years, encouraging both the state of California and the federal government so that we can preserve this park for all future generations. And we'd like to acknowledge the United States Marine Corps Camp Pendleton for their co-stewardship of this land. This amazing place, home to world-class surfing as well as endangered species, was threatened by a six-lane private toll road that would have destroyed the park and the pristine waves at Trestles. Fortunately, the Surfrider Foundation, along with the San Onofre Parks Foundation and coalition partners, including tribal representatives, thousands of activists, worked tirelessly to save Trestles through years of grassroots advocacy. All of this paid off recently when California signed a law that bans any future roads in the state park. As a WSL Pure partner and supporter of the We Are One Ocean initiative, we encourage everyone to join us and protect and conserve our global ocean. To learn more about the Surfrider Foundation's mission, visit us at surfrider.org. 
If you're not a surf rider, foundation member, get involved. Uh, you get great knowledge fed to you. You get really well educated on, on what the big challenges are and we are one ocean uh, has been fantastic throughout the year we've got a special treat for you now tahiti gave us some amazing highlights and as we go to break we're going to show you some of that and don't forget to download the adobe express app coral is such a huge part of our life as surfers it's what makes these amazing waves we have to try and protect it at all costs all the coral fragments are in the water and they will teach you how to make some ropes. We are on a mission to revolutionize ocean conservation and try to build a movement to help save coral reef ecosystems. It plays an important role, not just surfers, fishermen, fish, sharks, all kinds of wildlife and marine wildlife. Is that that one? We invite all the kids from um, our club and the community to come. It's just very important because the kids are the future. Download the Adobe Express app, search for World Surf League to get our custom template. Share your creations on social with hashtag CreateWaves and hashtag WeAreOneOcean and tag Adobe and WSL. We are one ocean. Welcome back to the 805 Post Show here at the Rip Curl WSL Finals. Our world champs, they got their trophies, they're in celebration mode and we're not too far away, but we've still got a couple of things to get through before we, uh, we tuck into these little treats here on, on the set. But, they're uh, nice and chilled though for you, Ronnie, no worries. How fun was today to have so many incredible guests on the show. We were blessed with the presence of, of world champions, Laura, but also some of the more uh, exciting surfers on the championship tour at the moment. Yeah, we had a lot of amazing, uh, you know, guests in uh, Lisa Anderson, Sophie Milanovic, Milanovic, and then obviously Mick Fanning, and who else? Who was your favourite? Debbie Beecham. Oh, uh, Slater, Lisa Anderson, you said that, right? Yeah, Tom no, Carroll. Tom Carroll. It was awesome. But uh, we also had Griffin Colapinto on the show, and Osby. Griffin, really popular, gave great insights on this location, and we know after he broke through and got his first two CT victories this year that he's going to be a force in 2023. But he's also been doing some great work behind the scenes with the Oakley Board Drive. Here's a fantastic story for you to check out. To me, to be able to donate boards to the kids in South Africa is a great feeling, knowing that these kids are going to start surfing for the first time. And I'm happy that we're able to give that to some other people. Man, I'm just stoked to pass it on to someone else, keep it, keep it going. Just stoke some other kids out. It's going to be sweet for them to get some boards, get involved in surfing, just kind of share the happiness that we all have here. Oh, this is huge for us because 
We've got over 130 kids in the program every month, so getting these boards is going to be really huge for us. Kids in our program have gone on to do incredible things, and that's really the important part of this, is we want to prepare the kids for being self-sustainable. The kid that makes it out of the streets, turns their life around, and does an ordinary job, well, that's an extraordinary story and something that they can be super proud of. And we were lucky enough to, to rub shoulders with some of those Groms over at J-Bay this year and just see the stoke on their faces when they received those boards. It was awesome. Yeah, anything. so cool. Yeah, anything. We were giving a little bit of grips, wax, uh, you know, boards, obviously. But uh, surfers, not street children, uh, great organization. They sure are. Uh, of course, the championship tour season is a wrap. Our, our champions are crowned, but we've still got to discover who's going to be joining the elite ranks to challenge for a, a final finish next season. Let's have a look at the Challenger Series schedule, which is uh, going to get back underway very soon with, uh, of course, that big event over there at Irisera, Pete. You're heading over? I, I've got the invite. Haven't uh, committed yet. Uh, I'm waiting to see if John gets a spot here. Punch <laughs> the uh, ticket. <laughs> First to the ninth is at, uh, in October. It, it's still almost have half the season. I mean, you think about these two, three events left, you know, with the Corona Sac Ramo going to go back there, and then the Holly Eva Challenger Series to finish out the season. We got 10 more surfers to add to the 24 that are already allocated by finish this season here on the championship tour. It's going to be awesome to see, and I love the big finish at Holly Eva because it's a, a wave that can test the competitors. There's a lot of power there, and uh, yeah, you, you really earn your place on the championship tour with so that cool. last event. But uh, let's talk uh, about crowning more world champions next month we've got the completion of the longboard world championships and we're going to be crowning our champs there at malibu it's going to be a lot of fun to watch that unfold it's been hotly contested so far this year and there's just been some i just think next level beauty in the approach of our longboard stars yeah i really cannot wait to see this uh malibu just one of the classic longboard waves just you know, the history there is uh, just amazing. So I'd love to try and watch that if I'm around. There's a big week there, October 3rd through the 13th for that, uh, the final. So you get to watch that and then you just roll into the Challenger Series in France, right? So it's like, uh, I'm sorry, in Portugal. Uh, and it's going to be surfing all day long, 24-7. Yeah, October, October's sorted. We're sweet for October. <laughs> but uh, September has also been pretty sweet as well. This is always a, a big one to, to highlight on the calendar. I, I really can't believe we got it done on the first day of the event window. Uh, really? Amazing result. History's been made here today, and it's now time to see uh, just how it all unfolded with our top five moments kicking off. At number five is going to be the eight-time world champ, Stephanie Gilmore, who saved herself in this heat, saved her run, Laura, with an incredible last-ditch effort. This was absolutely amazing. You know, Steph, she uh, she actually, Reese actually made a uh, priority mistake here. She, she blocked Steph and handed over the priority for Steph to get this in the dying minute and she capitalised. She ran out the beach. She didn't know if she'd got the score, but she did. Coming in at number two, Pete. Uh, the num uh, Sorry, number four was the number two seed. Jack Robinson, what a year he had. Yeah, and it's just unfortunate because he never really was able to get, this was the best wave he had, but it was later in the heat, and uh, you didn't expect that. But, uh, you know, considering what the season he's had and been able to, to pull out at the last minutes uh, throughout, you know, the event, but uh, unfortunately didn't happen here today. And then Italo coming in at number three, showed us his stamina, making it all the way to that world title matchup. Oh, we know he has, uh, like you said, the stamina. He trains for this. He's one of the fittest on tour, but, you know, just the amount of serving he did today, the amount of waves he rode, he just had so much fun on these little lefts that got him all the way into the final series, took down some big guns. He didn't get the world title, but, but you gave him the title of having the best abs on tour. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Some great steel. <laughs> <laughs> he is just, uh, this is when he's at his best. High energy, just feeling it, working the crowd, making his claims, but he was on fire today, Pete. Really explosive on the back end yeah, as he well. he had a good chance to take it all the way. He really did. I mean, Felipe, too strong, though. Didn't give him uh, that opportunity, really. Uh, and I like that Idlo was uh, able to get himself to number two in the world. You know, uh, that was a big feat in his own. But this guy coming in at number two in our top five moments, Felipe Toledo breaking through and on his very first wave in that uh, first title deciding matchup, he really showed us his power. Yeah, he did. And that was the fresh legs too, you know. I think that that's such a distinct advantage coming into this final five uh, 
format is that the fresh legs and you get two out of three. He didn't need three. He needed it in two and uh, congratulations to him. Well deserving. Yeah, it's a low dub had done the work. He had the stamina, but this guy too, he's been putting in a lot of work in anticipation of this big clash and all that work paid off today. So cool, it really was. And uh, again, there was a lot of fans down here um, for Felipe. So uh, yeah. congratulations to him and making everybody happy. He's had some uh, tough moments throughout his career, but he has persevered and broken through for a maiden world title. But at number one, our top five moments, it belongs to Stephanie Gilmore, eight world titles. And here's why she was in just career best form today. She really was. She had a shaky start, but she wiped that off and she just built from strength to strength and just was in dazzling form, turning, you know, just, just creating opportunities for herself here under priority, then winning the world title. Eight for 88. On the eight. Shut up, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable stuff. Stephanie Gimmel, I feel like out of respect, just with all the world titles, event wins and accolades she's collected, we almost talk about Steph being a a stronger competitor or more competitively savvy competitor than she is sometimes. We give her that respect, but today she showed it. Yeah. She really did put on a great performance. Well, we know whatever she ate for dinner last night, she's going to eat before every contest for the rest of her <laughs> life now because she's superstitious. It's all she's about probably, the dinner. She's probably going to have to wash that wetsuit and uh, yeah, well, then We had the cash too. cow, right? We had a new cash cow. <laughs> Mrs. Superstition. Well, guys, it's been a, an unbelievable day, a fantastic year. It's been a lot of fun calling the heats with you. Same. On behalf of our broadcast team, we want to say thanks for watching and make sure you enjoy these highlights and stay tuned to worldsurfleague.com for all your surf news. Love ya. I still want to see if I can match up against the best. World titles is something that I think about every day. I'm just grateful to be here because it's a special moment. I always won a trophy, you know. It's about history. Now I feel like I'm feeling comfortable on tour. Uh... I want to win a world title to prove to myself that I can do it. Trying to make every moment count. Competitively, it defines the best. That world title will come if you do what's right in front of you. To prove to myself that I can win and, of course, for my family. The time has finally arrived to witness the world title showdown. To have the best in the world competing here on finals day, I mean, today is the day that we'll have the biggest day in surfing and crowning world champ. I can't see it no other way. My life been one big fight. It's just another day. Gilmore does it. Her hope for an eighth world title continues. Look at these guys just battling. I'm headed to wherever God take me to. Knocking out haters saying, look at what you make me do. If anyone's going to go the distance and have the energy, I mean, Ito has so much in the tank. <laughs> I got my robe bone, Name across the back. Audio hustles. This is where it's at. Steph Gilmore moving on into match number three. Ethan. Wow. There it is. I got that knockout flow. They hit some hard like a knockout blow. Don't you see who I got in my corner? That's why I'm in the ring, doing what I wanna. I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna fight for mine. Stephanie Gilmore, what a performance. Wow. How's that? Match one, both sides of the draw, getting all the way to the title match. We didn't expect that. The stage is set for the Rip Curl WSL Finals for the title match. The best of three, it will be Carissa Moore taking on Stephanie Gilmore. We just live. Gilmore has just taken the first match to have the advantage. No warm-up required for Felipe. <laughs> One of the most deserving moments of Stephanie Gilmore's career, officially an eight-time world champion. Felipe stepping into motion. Big frontside hook. Felipe Toledo, your champion of the Rip Girl WSL Finals and your 2022 world champ. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Congratulations to Felipe.
This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.